right, gentlemen, looks like we are live. And to the audience, I want to welcome you all to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's much-anticipated debate on geocentrism between uh, Dr. Robert Singenis and Taylor from the Snake Was Right YouTube channel. Now, specifically, the proposition that we are debating tonight is geocent geocentrism is not a possible or scientific explanation of the universe. Taylor will be taking the affirmative for this debate and Dr. Robertson Jen is taking the negative. And so I'm excited for this. This is our uh, first official, I would say, geocentrism debate here on Standing for Truth. And it is an important topic. And I know a lot of you in the audience are passionate about this topic. So I think this is going to be a debate to remember. Now, before we get into opening statements, though, why don't we get acquainted, kind of break the ice, get to know our guests a little bit. Uh, Snake, why don't we start with you, since you're in the affirmative, uh, affirmative tonight. Just a little bit about yourself, also how you doing today, and a little bit about your, your YouTube channels. Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, and, uh, you know, I've given this spiel a bunch of times. So um, basically, uh, my background is in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. And I make mostly anti-religion, um, anti marxist but i repeat myself uh stuff and um you know kind of looking at uh scientific topics um uh, and religious topics through the lens of science and source methods um source methods is a big thing for me so i um basically you know i like my one of my personal journeys was from being a Marxist to an anti-Marxist. So I, I like to try and um, uh, get people out of uh, stuck religious mindsets using source methods primarily. And um, I think, um, yeah, we'll leave it there. Okay, Taylor, appreciate the introduction. Good to have you for this debate. Dr. Robertson Jenis, great to have you back as well. You're certainly no stranger to debates, nor a stranger to this channel as you've been here several times. So, uh, Robert, how you doing uh, tonight? And also a little bit about yourself. I'm a little tired tonight, actually. So I'm dragging a little bit. Um, I was working all day and got involved in something and, um, you know, didn't take a good enough break, I think. But uh, I, I'll, I'll survive, I think. So. <laughs> Uh, my adrenaline's pumping thanks to a debate they always do that to me right um, so i should be good um let me see what can i say um i am a catholic and i was a protestant prior i never was an atheist so i don't know what that's like but um i um started an apologetics organization oh, 30 years ago so uh, I'm probably old enough to be Taylor's father or maybe grandfather, who knows. Um, but I wanted to defend the Catholic faith. And um, so I've written a lot of theological books, a lot of biblical exegetical books. Um, I've debated probably, I have probably about 35 debates in the last 30 years. Um, I've lectured all over the world. Um, and um, I've been on CNN, I've been on EWTN, which is a Catholic station, I've been on the BBC, actually I had a debate with a Catholic guy named Bro uh, Brother Casamano um, on the BBC about 15 years ago, because, you know, Catholics mostly don't get into this stuff, they, um, they just take the mainline um, teaching from you know, evolutionists or whoever. And um, so I'm somewhat alone, but there are some Catholics out there that, you know, believe in creationism and um, I help them as much as I can. Um, so I've been doing that for a while and um, we have started, uh, what, our 30th year of Catholic apologetics. So that's where I come from. And um, my degrees, uh, BA, MA, and PhD are in religious studies. 
uh, but they cover the whole gamut basically from science to, you know, exegeting, you know, with the gospels or whatever. And um, so that's where my expertise is, but I, I'm also, you know, a, um, I would say a little between an amateur and a professional scientist, which is the reason I can cover these topics because I do know the science pretty well and especially the physics. I was a physics major in college for a couple of years before I changed to theology and got my degrees in theology. So at any rate, um, that's where I come from, and uh, that's what prepares me for a debate like this. Very good, Robert. Appreciate you being here. Like you said, debates, get the adrenaline going. They're kind of a natural energy drink, a, a natural kind of coffee. So I'm excited to have you both here, Robert and Taylor. Uh, and I will, uh, I'll mention I went to Catholic high school, so we've got at least that, uh, some background in common there. Oh, and you didn't lose your faith or you did lose your faith? <laughs> well, I, d I didn't have faith. I went, I was attracted to going to the school because I was looking for God. I was, I was an agnostic basically at the time. Um, that's where I was convinced to be an atheist. So I didn't lose or gain any faith per se. Um, I just kind of. I have a, a question I want to ask you, Taylor, before we start. Yeah. What does the snake was right mean? Um, it's, uh, yeah, maybe I should explain that in my intros. Um, yeah. I, I think I used to do that. But um, basically, it's, uh, well, the short of it is that the knowledge of good and evil <laughs> is a good thing. And basically, I, I find that that is a, a poet or like a literary poetic metaphorical uh, thing that you can apply to a lot of things um and it's basically it's kind of a little bit uh, about uh, forbidden knowledge and how knowledge is just a good thing and i, I look at uh, i enjoy a lot of biblical stories as literature and um but not interpreted literally um so it's basically just saying um that uh, knowledge comes with consequences, but ultimately it's it's worth the price. Okay, that's where I thought yeah. you were going with it, and you, you confirmed my belief. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, great introductions from the both of you. I appreciate this phase of the debate where we can kind of get to know each other a little bit before uh, the the formality begins. And so, for those in the audience that want to see more from our guests tonight, Taylor and Robert. Uh, my chat mod, appreciate it, uh, has the YouTube links and the relevant links for people to check out. So there's uh, Taylor's links and then also uh, Dr. Syngenesis links as well with a, a link to his documentary on the topic. So with that, let me go over the format tonight. So tonight's going to be a formal debate. We're going to keep it professional and focus on the arguments. And we're going to have 15 minute opening statements. Taylor is going to be kicking us off as he is in the affirmative. Then we're going to have two rounds of rebuttals. So this is going to be a comprehensive one. We're going to have rebuttal one, 10 minutes, rebuttal two, five minutes. Then we're going to jump into more of a free flowing discussion where Robert and Taylor can ask each other questions and discuss the topic. Then we'll wrap things up with a five minute closing statement. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We're going to have a roughly 25 minute audience Q and a period. And so if you do have a question, just tag me uh, at either at Donnie or standing for truth. That way I won't miss it. And let me know the questions for question for Robert question for Taylor. We'll have some fun. Okay. So with that, we're going to jump right into the first opening statement for tonight. Uh, Taylor, whenever you're ready, please just let me know. And you've got 15 minutes on the clock. Okay, I'll just start right away. So uh, to my understanding, geocentrism is the proposition that the Earth is stationary and the entire universe is spinning around it. And I'm sure there's more to it than that, but uh, that's basically what we're working with. Um, the history of geocentrism is quite interesting. Um, obviously, ancient peoples struggled with the question of what exactly are we even on? Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of intersects with flat Earth a little bit. Um, mostly people thought that uh, the Earth was the center of the universe because, well, we're special. And so, of course, we're the center of the universe because what else is there out there? Um, and then, But then as we 
gained more knowledge, we discovered that the universe is quite vast and we are in fact just not even really measurably significant on that scale other than from our own perspective. Um, so, but there is a scientific history as well. Uh, most people who hold to it nowadays um, seem to state that it's based in a defense of their religion, which uh, to me makes it uh, a little bit suspicious from from that angle. But as I mentioned, there are there is a legitimate scientific history to at least geocentrism, flat Earth, um, not so, not as much. Um, in the, you know, there was still geocentrism around in like the 1800s, even early 1900s uh, in the sciences. And so um, they were playing with this idea for a while. And uh, before every iteration of geocentrism um, is its requisite, the lumin luminiferous ether. Um, and these were disproven over the course of you know the 19th uh, 20th centuries and um for, from the same scientists who proposed and uh, held these uh, hypotheses um were forced to abandon them due to their uh, failed experiments um the luminiferous ether was a hypothesized medium by which light could propagate through um they thought light can't go through a vacuum without some sort of medium. So a vacuum, so there's a vacuum isn't really a vacuum. There's must be something else there. Um, think of how sound needs uh, some kind of um, medium to propagate through. It can, it can go through solids, but generally it's more of a fluid. Um, waves need some kind of flow, fluid to move through. Um, so people thought the same was true of light. And uh, if, um, yeah, if, if it moves in a vacuum, it, there must be something else there to allow it to move. So there were two schools of thought, really, on the ether. One was that physical matter kind of dragged the ether medium with its motion. Or the alternative was that the ether was stationary, but physical objects moved through it and could, you know, create kind of a wind effect because you're moving past stationary objects. So relative to you it seems like it's moving toward you um so there was something called the i um, might butcher the pronunciation of some of these the fizzo experiment um two beams of light were shot through water moving against the light and water moving through the light the explanation was that ether was dragging along with the water increasing or decreasing the speed of light so scientists then adopted um another scientist, Fresnel's drag coefficient, um, which was an equation based on ether. And this kind of seemed to confirm the ether hypothesis. Um, Hendrik Lorentz then proposed a stationary ether and modified Fresnel's coefficient into his, what we know as the Lorentz transformations, uh, which used a time variable to transition between reference frames and uh, because the difference here is, again, the stationary versus moving ether. And then after a lot of this kind of stuff was going on, Einstein, uh, famous Albert Einstein, realized that all this, all that was needed to explain all these experiments, including the one I mentioned, um, was the principle of relativity and constant speed of light. Um, and he derived the previously mentioned Lorentz transformations simply from those two principles and thus the ether was not needed so and then continuing in that trend max von lau demonstrated that fresnel's coefficient could be derived simply from relativistic addition of velocities thus all the ad hoc additions to the ether theory in order to save it from the its sinking ship were rendered completely irrelevant because the uh, people proposing ether had to keep changing what it was every time um, there was an experiment, they had to fit it to this new experiment. Einstein proved none of this was necessary. Other notable experiments in this tradition are the michelson morley michelson gal pearson Aries experiment. Uh, Michelson and Morley confirmed Fresnel's drag coefficient, which would seem to confirm um, 
the uh, the Fizeau experiment, which was the first one I mentioned, with the water. And um, so they confirmed those equations, um, and that would seem to confirm ether at the time. However, they went on to conduct their own experiments. These were um, ether believers. They hoped to find ether wind, um, and they used light reflection uh, and interference devices to measure the displacement of light um, hy hypothetically due to the ether, and the experiment failed. Albert Mike Mickelson wrote uh, that, quote, the experiments on the relative motion of the earth and ether have been completed and the result decidedly negative. And he goes on to explain why, but we'll try and keep it short here. Um, the expected variations in ether wind were not observed and thus the ether model was not panning out. And as Einstein showed, every aspect of ether uh, hypothesis that did work could be replaced by general relativity. In the Michelson-Gale ex Pearson experiment, the angular velocity of Earth was measured with a similar larger device, and the angular velocity matched that predicted by heliocentric astronomy and not that predicted by a stationary ether producing a wind effect on light. And I'm going to switch over real quick. All right, so George Airy performed an experiment with a uh, water-filled telescope to test the ether's effect on stellar aberration, and that is the apparent position of a celestial body being different from its actual position due to the length of time it takes for photons to travel to the observer in the motion of the observer. In this image, we see that the red photon travels in a straight line on the left, but in the right one, once it hits the ether, it adopts this kind of sideways vector and moves with its reference frame. If the ether hypothesis were true, then there would be no stellar aberration, uh, i.e. no need to tilt the telescope, as when a photon enters the Earth's ether field, then it is dragged along with the Earth's reference frame. But instead, the tilt depends entirely on the velocity of the Earth. So basically, that this is why it's relevant to uh, geocentrism. The Earth is moving. It's not stationary. And... This uh, telescopic effect cannot be manipulated with things thought to affect the ether, like water, which is what Airy was putting in his telescope in this experiment. This is um, inconsistent with ether hypothesis. Um, and so what do geocentrists and, I'd mentioned, flat earthers make the same conclusions? What do they conclude from these experiments that all disconfirm the principles of the luminous ether according to the ether believers that devise the experiments trying to confirm ether well they conclude that these experiments in fact demonstrate the existence of ether even though the results are contradictory to the principles of the ether so moving on to more directly applicable um stuff uh, this is a comparison of heliocentric orbits on the left or yeah heliocentric and uh geocentric orbits on the right. So the geocentric model of the universe, it kind of, it pretty much works fine under general relativity to an extent because it relativity doesn't depend on the reference frame. But the problem is that it is an energetic problem. If the entire universe is spinning around the earth, the amount of energy that that it takes is beyond astronomical, pardon the pun, it would require acceleration of entire galaxies to traverse distances of hundreds of thousands of light years in the time of a single day, constantly. Um, that's, the amount of energy that would take is just unimaginable. Obviously, there's no known energy source or mechanism to create this acceleration, and even on the smaller scale, you can see that the orbit of planets is changing in these strange directions. And th this is a simplification. This was just a real easy image. Um, hopefully, uh, Robert doesn't take it as a misrepresentation. Um, but you can see that the planetary bodies, since in heliocentrism, they're orbiting the sun, and they're still orbiting the sun in geocentrism, but the sun is also orbiting the earth, um, relative to the earth, they're making these strange loop-de-loops. So 
if the earth is the absolute reference frame here in blue, then the planets are actually making turns in the middle of their orbits for seemingly no reason. Under heliocentrism, it, it it's fine. It's just an orbit, a regular orbit. It doesn't uh, stop and change direction. Um, but uh, yeah, let's take a look, at, a closer look at the epicycles. Um, you know, there's mass and other things that we agree on for orbit. I, I think Robert accepts gravity. Um, but he wants us to believe that the epicycles pictured on the right are the true motions of the planets. Um, so here's E. If E here is Earth, F is the sun here up on the top left. Um, and P over there on the top left is any planet in the solar system. They're doing bizarre loop-de-loops and changing direction for no known reason. And, and my interlocutor here is proposing all these unknown forces at inconceivable magnitudes when they're completely unnecessary to describe the motion. If they orbit around the sun due to gravity, then why wouldn't the Earth as well? And that would simplify everything as well. Um, and moreover, why is the mass, uh, why is the much more massive sun and Jupiter and others orbiting the much smaller mass of the Earth and what's keeping the Earth stationary? What's stopping it from getting pulled by the sun's gravity? Even if it started stationary, like let's assume God or something placed the Earth stationary in the middle and then set all these things around the Earth, uh, it would eventually be pulled toward the sun and we'd end up with this heliocentric model, assuming gravity. But instead, we have, under geocentrism, this locked sort of Earth, locked somehow by some unknown forces, preventing it from interacting gravitationally with the sun, uh, although the sun is somehow interacting gravitationally with the Earth. And all these other bodies are not orbiting the Earth. They're, they're doing strange things. Um, and... Uh, under unknown mechanisms. So think of how much energy is required to j move just one planet. And the entire galaxies are experiencing this kind of acceleration at every moment of every day. Um, and with no known source. So it's because to change direction, you have to accelerate an object in a different direction. So you have to apply force, which requires energy. Um, and this is happening at every moment of every day. We're moving entire galaxies, hundreds of thousands of light years, if not millions, every day, twice a day. And meanwhile, the heliocentric model has all these movements explained with just gravity, and it doesn't have this enormous energetic cost associated with it. Um, my interlocutor here has to propose forces that he has no way of accounting for in patterns that are just have no explanation. It just works on paper sometimes. Um, so which is more parsimonious? I asked the audience and thank you. Okay, Taylor, thank you for that 15 minute opening statement. We're now going to hand it over to Dr. Robertson Jenis whenever you're ready. You also have 15 minutes for an opening statement. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. All right. So um, I, since Taylor is going in this direction with the ether and um, his diagrams and all, I'm going to change my opening statement to try to match his, to make this debate interesting. Because if I start talking about what I wanted to talk about, we're on two different levels. You see, there's a lot of ways to understand or attack this whole geocentric thing. And he's on one level, and I was going to go on another level, but that would make it rather boring. So I'm going to interact a lot with what he just said. I know that's not usually the case for an opening statement, but 
I, I don't, don't want people to get bored out there. So um, let me attack this first issue first, um, or the last issue first, which is where's all the energy coming from? Okay. So in the, um, in the Newtonian model of the solar system, um, the same basic question could be asked, where is the energy coming from for the Earth to accelerate around the sun? Uh, we call it inertia or momentum, but there's an energy being ex expended. And the question is, where is it coming from? What's pushing the Earth? You can give it a name and say it's inertia or momentum, but that doesn't really explain it. All, all you're saying is that inertia is an inert, uh, inherent uh, pr property of a body to move once it's pushed. Okay. All right. So let's take that. Let's take, let's take that definition of why something moves, where it's getting the energy to move, and apply that to the geocentric universe. Well, that's rather easy because the universe, as massive as it is, once you push that, where it starts to accelerate and rotate, it's not going to stop. It's going to keep on going. Why? Same reason that the heliocentrists have. It's called inertia. And then that develops into what we call angular momentum. And that angular momentum, according to physics laws, is going to be conserved, meaning it's not going to stop anywhere. It's if you try to stop the rotation of the universe, it's going to the angular momentum is going to be transferred somewhere else. Okay, so that's our answer to where all the energy comes from. Once God pushes it, and somebody's going to have to push it, it's going to go on ad infinitum. As a matter of fact, it's going to be more stable than an Earth rotating on its axis because the Earth has to put up with all kinds of internal and external forces that want it to stop, like earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, um, asteroids hitting it, or there's about a dozen things out there internally and externally that try to slow down the rotation of the Earth. And that's a question that I would pose to any heliocentrist. What makes the Earth so stable that we have a sidereal rate of 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.1 seconds every day? That wouldn't be hard for a rotating universe because of its sheer mass, once you push that thing, it will rotate ad infinitum because of its angular momentum. Okay, so that's where we get all the energy for this. Now, um, how do we transfer from Newton to a geocentric universe? Well, you know, Newton struggled with this himself. He admitted in Proposition 43 of his uh, Principia Mathematica that if there were the proper forces outside the solar system, that the sun would revolve around the earth. As long as those four outside forces balanced with the sun and uh, kept at a certain distance from the earth, the, the, the sun could go around. He admitted that. Okay. But why couldn't he do it in his prior system? Well, because he confined the, the system to our solar system and forgot about the rest of the universe. For Newton, the rest of the universe was inert. It was absolute. It could not move. It was just there and sort of acted like a background to the, all the motion that was going on in the solar system. So if you have that kind of system where you're limited to a sun and you know eight or nine planets, well, of course, the Earth is going to have to go around the sun because the sun has greater mass. And if it has greater mass, it has greater gravity. So in order to stop from being pulled into the sun, the Earth and the other planets are going to have to go around the sun at a certain speed so that they're not pulled in by the sun's gravity. I admit that. OK, but what happened in physics was that Newton was basically the first one to give us that kind of force model, gravitational model. There were others that came along after him, particularly Ernst Mach and Albert Einstein, who said that Newton had no right to confine the system to our solar system, that there was a whole big universe out there with plenty of stars. And we know there's probably about five, septil uh, five sextillion stars out there that all had gravity. And where was that gravity going? 
How is it affecting things? Well, Ernst Mach said, hey, you really have no right to say, uh, Dr. Newton, that the, the universe is absolute because of all the force out there. As a matter of fact, we could say, Ernst Mach said, that we could rotate the universe and have a Earth that's fixed and not rotating and have the same forces, the same inertial forces created in your heliocentric system, you see. So that took 200 years for us to figure out, and thank God that he did. And then Albert Einstein developed Mach's theory and said, yes, that's how he got to the whole thing of relativity. Because relativity says, look, it really makes no difference whether you have a rotating Earth in a fixed universe that doesn't move, as opposed to a fixed Earth with the universe rotating around it. That's relativity. And that's what Mach and Einstein gave us. And that's basically what geocentrism is based on. We're just taking Albert Einstein's relativity and saying, okay, now let's apply that to geocentrism. As a matter of fact, in Einstein's general relativity, he said that it has to be this way. Otherwise, relativity is not viable. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't just a geometric thing that he was talking about. He said that the equations of general relativity, all his tensor equations, had to support a geocentric universe. Why? Well, they have to, otherwise relativity makes no sense, okay? So, again, you know, we're not just pulling rabbits out of a hat here and saying, well, you know, geocentrism looks nice to have the Earth in the center and everything going around it because we're special, which is how Taylor opened up his, his, his speech. Um, uh, yeah, that does play a part in it because once mankind finds out that, hey, to have the earth in the center and not moving and the universe revolving around it, what does that mean? Well, that means we are significant because the center occupies only one place in the whole universe, right in the middle. And if we occupy that, that means ipso facto, we are significant. That means we're not out there in the remote recesses of space like Carl Sagan wanted us to be with no signpost saying, here you are, we have one in geocentrism, right here in the center. Now, if you were the apple of God's eye and special in God's eye, where would he put you then if you were so significant? Well, he put you right in the center. And we have the physics to back it up. Okay. So just to deal with that issue first, um, how much time do I have left, uh, Donnie? Oh, you just hit the nine-minute marks. So you got about six minutes, Robert. Six minutes. Okay. All right, so let's um, let's talk about this. Um, okay, let me deal with this um, flower loop to loop thing that you dealt with because you seem to spend a lot of time on that. And um, you know, this is the kind of common criticism we get about geocentric, but it's it's really elementary because um, what's happening here is that the Earth is in the the Earth is the center of mass of the universe. And the center of mass, by definition in physics, is something that doesn't move unless the whole system is pushed and the center of mass will move along with it. But the universe isn't going anywhere. So if you're the center of mass of the universe, you are you stay put because all the inertial forces that the universe generates are going to keep the Earth right in the center. Okay, and then when I say inertial forces, I'm talking about the centrifugal force, the Coriolis force, and the Euler force. All three of those forces are created by the angular momentum of a rotating universe. And since the, the centri centrifugal force would tend to push a planet or star out to the rim of the universe, but then you have the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force brings everything back. It's like the retardation force to the centrifugal force. And it's two, it's twice the magnitude of the centrifugal force. And what you end up with, and you can go find this on Wikipedia, what you end up with is a set of forces that if you have the rotating universe, all the stars and the sun 
will stay in their respective positions as the whole thing rotates around the center of mass. And the Earth just happens to be at the center of mass. Now, you don't need the Earth to be there. You know, we can just take the Earth out of the equation and just have the stars and the sun. And if they're rotating with the universe, that is, the universe is carrying all of them by these inertial forces that it creates, um, it, everything's going to rotate around the center of mass. Now, we geocentrists come in there and say, okay, well, let's put the Earth in there at the center of mass. It's not going to move either because it occupies the center of mass. Now, the inertial forces will affect it a little bit, just like the sun's gravity affects the tides on Earth. It affects it a little bit, and that's why we see hurricanes going to the left in the northern hemisphere and to the right in the southern hemisphere, because the Coriolis force, although it's very minimal, still is hitting 4,000 miles from the center of mass because the Earth's center of mass is 4,000 miles inwards. So we have 4,000 miles, and once you get out that far, you're going to be affected by the inertial forces of the universe. So that's why we have hurricanes going in opposite directions. That's why we have the Foucault pendulum. That's why we have bullets going one way or the other way, depending on which way you're shooting them. All kinds of things can be explained by that. All right. So um, when you get to this diagram that uh, Taylor gave us that shows this sort of loopy loop kind of thing, it's not some haphazard thing. It's because, and uh, Donnie, I don't know if you can do it now, but if you could bring up... Um, uh, Ori Tectonic 28S? Yes, definitely. Okay. I'll pause your timer as I'm finding it as well, just so we okay. don't. Okay, so I got the files here. And the name of uh, this one right here? Yeah. Second one? Ori Tectonic, yeah. Okay, so you see what's happening here is the Earth is fixed in the center. The sun is going around the Earth, and the planets... There's uh, Mercury, uh, Venus, and Mars going around the sun. Well, those planets are making a loop-de-loop -loop from the perspective of Earth, but they're doing so for a reason, and that is because they're going around the sun. The sun is in control of those planets for the same reason the heliocentrists have the planets in control of the sun. The gravity of the sun versus the inertia of the planets. So, you know, obviously they're not going to go in a straight line or a curved line because they're going around the sun. So that's easily explained. All right, so you can take that off now. All right, so um, I want to deal with this ether issue because um, uh, I don't think Taylor fully represented it the way it should be. And uh, it's an important issue because, look, even Einstein, when he got rid of the ether in special relativity to try to answer Michelson Morley's experiment in 1887, um, he, he uh, 10 years later, when he developed general relativity, he took the ether back. Okay. So you have a blaring contradiction in the physics of Albert Einstein, uh, uh, where you can, when you compare special relativity to general relativity. So all this idea that, you know, light can travel making its own medium by, you know, a magnetic uh, pulses and things. Is that, I have one minute left? Yes. Oh, man, that went fast. <laughs> time flies by. Yeah, okay. So I, I'm not going to have time to get into the ether, but I, I do want to point that out, that general relativity is completely different than special relativity. Special relativity worked in an inertial frame where you had no gravity and you had no inertial forces. And that, that may have worked for Einstein to answer Michelson Morley's experiment because the opposite answer would not be special relativity. Guess what it would be? It would be a fixed earth that doesn't move. And that's why they measured no ether because the earth wasn't moving through it, you see. But they didn't like that explanation. So they, they adopted special relativity. And now relativity is the answer to everything. But 10 years later, Einstein found out, well, my special relativity doesn't have any gravity or inertial forces. So what am I going to do? I have to develop a whole new theory. And when he did, guess what? He went right back to geocentrism because general relativity allows a geocentric universe, as I just explained, you see. And uh, so anyway, I think my time is up. 
Okay, Robert, thank you very much for that 15 minute opening statement. Gentlemen, that concludes the opening statements. I appreciate it. And to the audience, I am all caught up on questions, so thank you for being so engaged in this important debate. Uh, we're now moving into our rounds of rebuttals. First round of rebuttal is 10 minutes. And Taylor, whenever you're ready, you get the floor for your first rebuttal. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so in his answer to try and describe where this problem of where the energy is coming from to move entire, well, one universe. Um, so he said his answer was that it's inertia is giving the energy. So I'm not sure if there's a problem of communication or what, but inertia is not a source of energy. Um, it's actually gravity can change some things, uh, can accelerate something towards something, but inertia cannot. Inertia is not energy to move. It's it's the tendency to not move. It's the, like the exact opposite. It's, it's the reason energy is necessary for movement. So, I mean, according to physics, inertia is not the reason the Earth moves or it's, it's not even a form of energy at all. It just means that it, we need energy in order to move the earth or any other physical body. Gravity can explain that. Um, inertia is not going to explain why something moves. It's only going to explain why it, it doesn't move. Um, and I also took physics, even though I major in biology, but this was, uh, this is pretty much physics 101. It's very basic and fundamental stuff. Um, and yeah, the earth has, um, you also question like why the earth is moving or why, how the earth continues rotating and doesn't slow down its rotation. And the answer to that again is physics 101. It's, it's the conservation of angular momentum. So in inertia, the, your answer to the first question is the answer here is you need energy to decelerate this object just as you need energy to accelerate it. So if something ha is has spin energy, the energy is in it. You have to do something to get the energy out of it. Uh, and that, that's conservation of mass and energy. Uh, and it works with angular, mo it works with any momentum, it works with angular momentum. So yeah, I'm not sure what you're getting at with this inertial forces thing. Um, Cause it's, it's, Really what it is, is it's the resistance to acceleration. Um, so it doesn't seem like you addressed what force is actually making galaxies rotate at millions of light years and under 12 hours. Um, there's no, like what I didn't mention it in the opening, but the, it's, it's not just an energetic problem. It's literally like mass and energy and light cannot move at that speed under any known conditions so and this is derivable from fundamental physics it's not just observed it's that the fundamental uh, quantum physics and and relativity make these predictions that are the same as our observations as the maximum speed of mass and energy um, as the speed of light and so if we're saying that we're observing the entire universe rotate around the earth, then this universe is basically breaking the known laws of physics, not just the observed laws of physics, but the laws of physics that can be derived from the fundamental laws of physics, which is the speed of light. It can be derived many ways, which is cross confirmation, which is how we know that it's most likely true. Um, so he didn't seem to answer where this, energy comes from. I didn't bring it up, so he didn't obviously address uh, why they're breaking the speed of light or how that's even possible. Um, and how, how do they know to revolve around the Earth? This, this will go into the next point, but I have a lot of questions about this. How do they know to revolve around the Earth? What? Because under gravity, the planets, quote unquote, know that the sun is there based on the attraction of gravity. Um, so what's the interaction between the universe and the earth? What, what makes them 
able to orient themselves around the earth, all these galaxies. Um, obviously, they're not consciously doing this. Um, and where does the energy come from? And so we get to, you said that the earth is the center of mass in the universe. And again, this is just physics 101. When we talk about and calculate the center of mass in physics, we're talking about a rigid body. This, like, this was drilled into us when talking about center of mass. And a lot of other things to do with calculations in physics. Rigid body um, is assumed in a lot of things. Rigid body is mentioned over and over again because it's very uh, key in order to understand this concept. In order for the Earth to be the center of mass of the universe, then we have to treat the whole universe as a single rigid connected body. But it's not, is it? The The Earth is a rigid body, but the Earth is not contiguous, is not a continuous rigid body with Mars or anything else free moving out in the universe. They're about as disconnected as it's possible to be. Um, so that's a major problem there. Going back to my previous uh, list of points and questions is, so again, how does the all of the celestial bodies in the entire universe orient themselves around the Earth? Why do they change direction precisely um, to rotate around the Earth? Not only where does the energy come from, but what mechanism is driving them to do this? Well, I'll give you the free energy for for right now. How does how is the energy being applied in this consistent manner? How how does it know to rotate around the Earth? With gravity, it makes sense, but the Earth is not the uh, it's not on a rigid body, so it can't be the center of mass, and it's not the most massive object in the universe, so it can't have a gravitational effect on everything so what effect is it having on everything that's causing it to rotate um a, a again a rigid body has uh conservation of angular momentum but you don't have conservation of orbit like like talking about inertia you can't just throw an object into an orbit and it just spins forever and doesn't lose its uh it's it'll spin like like a discrete object can spin, but it can't rotate around um, a fixed point due to inertia or due to conservation of mass and energy. Because it, if you set it in a direction, it's just going to keep going. It needs an acceleration to change its course around a point or around another object. So gravity takes care of that. There's no known force that's that's causing um, the galaxies rotating around the Earth to do that because they have to be connected to the Earth in order to be have the Earth as the center of mass in order to conserve the rotational momentum there. Um, and then, as for light needing a medium, I don't understand why anyone ever thought this or why we think it now um, because they never thought that mass needed a medium to travel through. They thought mass could just go right through a vacuum and, and it's fine. And so why would light need it? And if we understand the actual particle physics of why sound needs a medium to move through, it's because it is the physical movement of mass. The reason you hear something is because there is mass fluctuating against your eardrum. So it is mass. That's why it needs mass as a propagation. Um, and so light doesn't, uh, can just go through uh, nothingness, a vacuum. Um, and then for the final point, Robert also said that if it has greater mass, then it has greater gravity. And so again, that it, he kind of failed to address my question about why the planets are orbiting the sun, but there's, uh, which has greater mass, greater mass on the Earth, and why is the Earth stationary when everything is already orbiting around the sun, as a heliocentrist would predict, except for the Earth, so that all the planets are, are doing fine, um, except for the Earth. So what is keeping the Earth stationary and not moving towards the sun 
since the sun has greater gravity, we agree that gravity is a thing. And so the earth should be accelerating toward the sun. And if the earth is does not have uh, a velocity of some kind, then it's going to just going to go straight toward the sun. Um, some kind of velocity um, perpendicular to the sun or um, that would cause an orbit because orbits you need um, acceleration toward the center, but you also need acceleration to the side. Right. So if it doesn't have that sideways acceleration, it's going to go straight towards the the mass attracting it, which in this case would be the sun. And so we need we need an explanation of why the Earth is being stationary. And I think I think that's I think I'm done. Did we lose Donnie? <laughs> I just noticed that. Um, I guess uh, so. Uh, if he's not going to come back within a, a little bit, uh, I guess you should just go into your uh, ten minute. Yeah, and you're muted, so I can't hear you. Do you want to? Can you take yourself off mute? There you go. Yeah. 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 Okay. Boy. Well, do you, do you want me to time it or? Uh, yeah, you can time it. Okay. Um, don't start it yet. Um, yeah. I want to give Donnie a little time to come back. And um, there he yeah, is. <laughs> so sorry about that. My Ethernet cable got pulled out upstairs. The kids are playing around. Oh. My apologies. <laughs> so there is an ether. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> first time for everything. So let me. I'm not sure how much I missed, Taylor. It looks like my timers. I'm guessing you just basically ended not too long ago. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about, you know, just going straight into the other one. But you're okay. Back. Apologies, gentlemen. Appreciate it. We're good to go, though. So. Okay, we're moving into uh, Robertson, Jenis, and your 10-minute uh, rebuttal. So whenever Perfect. you're ready, the floor is yours. All right, so let's talk about inertia. Now, I agree that inertia in its initial definition is the resistance of a body to be moved, okay? And that depends on the mass of the body and the gravity that's surrounding it, of course. But there's also another understanding of inertia. That is, once the body starts moving... Okay, it's going to keep on moving unless a net external force is applied to it to stop it from moving. So inertia has two phases to it, and you have to understand both of them to understand what I was talking about. Um, I didn't say inertia was energy. Okay, I, I, as a matter of fact, I made a point that the, the heliocentrists just label the movement of the Earth as its inertia. It goes by its inertia. Well, what's inertia? What makes a body keep on moving once you push it? That's been a question that we've had since the time of Aristotle. Aristotle thought there was a force that continually pushed the object. Okay, and then we came up to Newton and he said no. But he never gave an explanation uh, other than what uh, Aristotle said. So we just have a word that we apply to an object that's moving and will continue to move unless uh, stopped by a ex net external force. So I know the physics, okay? I know you, you, you mentioned physics 101 a couple of times, but I want to give you, give you physics 102, okay? Um, the energy comes from the fact that I said God pushed it. That's the initial energy, and that's all it takes because once you push an object, the inertia property of the object will keep it moving ad infinitum until another force stops it. That's the law of physics. So that's where the energy comes from. It just takes one push and that's it. Okay. So um, um, now you said the, the earth goes by its own angular momentum when it, when it rotates. Well, so you're just proving my point about the universe. All I'm doing is making the Earth bigger. I'm making it the size of the universe. So it's going to have angular momentum, just like your Earth does to rotate every day at, on clock. Okay? Same principles involved. Just one's bigger than the other. That's it. All right. So um, now you said you need energy to stop or start. You, of course you do. That's why I mentioned earthquakes. Okay? That's supposed to slow down the rotation of the earth. 
and we have a million earthquakes per year. So there should be some slowing down. As a matter of fact, most evolutionists believe the Earth was rotating twice as fast about a billion years ago. Not that I believe in evolution, but they know that the, that the tendency is for the Earth to slow down because of all the net external forces uh, and internal forces like earthquakes that would make it slow down. Okay, I'm just saying the universe doesn't have that problem because it's so big. The mass is so big. There's nothing out there that's going to affect it, either internally or externally. Now, you didn't explain uh, why the galaxy. You said I didn't explain how the galaxies uh, are rotating. Well, they're rotating because of those inertial forces I told you about. And I thought that went over your head because you didn't uh, you you didn't make the connection between how the bodies are staying in their respective positions as they rotate with the universe, it's because of those inertial forces. The centrifugal versus the Coriolis force keeps those planets and stars and everything else that's in the universe in that same position. That's why we see the same things rotating around us every night. What's holding them there? It's the inertial forces of the rotating universe, okay? All right, now you said um, light and mass cannot ex exceed certain speeds. That's false, okay? That's why I was trying to make the difference between special relativity and general relativity. Special relativity only is the theory that says light speed is constant and can't go above C, okay? Einstein found that that didn't work too well in the universe because there's all kinds of gravity and inertial forces in the universe, so he had to come up with another theory. And that's general relativity. And in general relativity, light and mass can go any speed, any speed. I would suggest you go read up on Einstein's general relativity or some books that are commentaries on his relativity. They all tell you the same thing. They don't like to admit it, but that's what the theory says. Why? Well, because he believes in relativity. And if relativity allows a geocentric universe, then those stars out there are going to have to go superluminal speeds around the Earth. Okay, that must be. And he has the equations to show us how it's done in general relativity. So you really need to know the difference between special and general relativity to, un to have the first understanding of where geocentrism is coming from. Um, you said the universe is breaking all the laws all laws of physics. That's not true from what I just said, because they all work on general relativity. Okay. Um, how do they know that the, to go around the earth? Well, if you have a spherical universe, it's only going to go and it moves. That is, it rotates. It's only going to go in one direction. So everything that's inside the universe is going to go around the center of mass. It has to. It can't go anywhere else. And what's what, again, is going to keep those stars in their places as they go with the universe? It's the inertial forces that are created by the, re, the rotating universe. Okay? There, yeah, I agree with you. There has to be some force keeping them there. Okay? And I've explained what it is. You talk about the center of mass has to be a rigid body, not necessarily. Okay, it works better with a rigid body, but you can have a sphere of gas and rotate it, and it's going to have a center of mass. Why? Because you have molecules there, they may be dispersed and move around, so the center of mass is not going to be easily defined. But if you rotate that sphere of gas, you're going to have a center of mass. Okay, so it's not necessarily true now. Um, Let's talk about uh, the fact that what is space, okay? Well, Einstein tried to tell us that it's a vacuum. Well, what's a vacuum? Well, that, pre that purports to say that there's no mass in a vacuum. Now, quantum mechanics has come along and just blew that to smithereens, okay? The ether came back with quantum mechanics because we know that it's a vacuum to our senses, yes, but there are particulate, there's particulate matter in space that, that is so, um, so refined that we can, we can only theorize it. We can't even calculate it. There's, I don't know if you've read any of my books on this, but there's a guy who won the Nobel Prize in 1993 for physics named Robert Laughlin, who told us that, you know, if you hit it hard enough in the vacuum of space, you can see the matter come out of it, Okay. But it's just so discreet now that we call it a vacuum, 
but it's not really a vacuum in the full sense of the word. It's it's matter, it's space, but it's so discreet that we can't see it, smell it, or touch it or anything, but it's there. Now, if, the, if that wasn't true, then we would have to say that it's nothing, that, that, that space is nothing. But if it's nothing, then it, that means it doesn't exist, okay? Because the definition of nothing means it doesn't exist. There's nothing that exists in that location, okay? But you can't have that because nothing can exist. There has to be a something there. And our advanced science and quantum mechanics, and even Einstein himself, as I said, in general relativity, took back the ether. And as a matter of fact, when he took back the ether, he said it acted as a medium for light and all electromagnetic forces. Okay? So you need to brush up on this. All right. Um, you made a... Let me see. Why is Earth not okay? So, I'll leave you with your last question, which is, why is the Earth not taken in by the Sun, whereas the other planets are controlled by the Sun's gravity? Because the Earth is locked in place. Okay, that's what the center of mass is. See what you're forget you you're you're still doing the Newtonian dance, which is you're trying to deal just with the Sun and the planets and the Earth. Can't do that. Not in this geocentric universe. You got a whole universe out there that that is transferring its forces and you want to know what the medium is i just explained it to you because space is not empty it's transferring its forces all the way to the center and it's holding that center of mass locked in place so the earth isn't going to go anywhere the only thing it's going to feel as a center of mass is a little bit of the sun's gravity or even the planet's gravity because there may be perturbations of the planets out there um, but it's not going to move, okay? And that's why we have tides. We have tides because of the moon and the sun having their gravity against the earth. But if the earth were moving, then the water and the earth would move along together. In order to have tides, you have to have the, the solid portion of the earth stable and fixed so that the water can go back and forth. That's why we have tides. So we understand that gravity is still at work in the solar system, but it doesn't come close to moving the Earth, which is the center of mass of the universe. All right, so I did my piece there. I'll stop there. Okay, Dr. Robertson, Dennis, thank you very much for that 10-minute rebuttal. That concludes the first rebuttal portion of this debate. Excellent debate so far, gentlemen. We're moving into our second rebuttal now. Now for this second rebuttal, a little bit more fast paced. This one is five minutes. And so Taylor, whenever you're ready, please let me know. I'll start your timer and the floor is yours. All right, so um, first of all, every source that I looked up, I could not find anything that said that general relativity uh, allows for a greater speed limit than the speed of light. Uh, I don't know if you misspoke or what's going on here. I looked up a bunch of stuff about the speed limit in general relativity. Specifically, they all explicitly describe that there is a speed limit in general relativity, which is the speed of light. Um, so I, I'm going to need to see what your source is for that. Um, and so you did say that the solution to the energy problem is inertia. Okay. Um, I think maybe we did clarify a little bit here. So um, we agree that uh, what makes a body keep on moving after it's push, uh, and we can say that that's inertia. Okay, we agree here. Um, and inertia works as an explanation for a rotating body. Okay, we agree there as well. Um, the problem is that that doesn't work for arc motions of objects. They will move in a straight line, um, and, but to get them to change direction or to arc uh, or um, a half arc or a full arc, which would be a circle, you need um, acceleration to the side. So if you're moving in a direction, you need to accelerate in a different direction in order to make an arc or a curve. Uh, imagine, you know, there's a sun in the middle. If you're moving toward the sun and you pass the sun, it will bend the movement toward 
that sun because it is accelerating it toward the sun. So with the galaxies rotating around the, the Earth, I'll, I'll give you, uh, for free, I'll give you that God made it all and he pushed it in a certain way initially and gave gave the first motion to all objects in the universe i'll just give that to you that's fine um but it it can't you can't push an object in a way that it's going to curve so this is why you can't really throw something around an object there are there are kind of ways to do it but that has to do with um bouncing it off the air essentially um but if you throw something out it's going to go in a straight line you can't you can't throw something around yourself if that makes sense um it would need to either use uh, i guess lift or uh, air resistance to curve like that that would be how like a boomerang or something works but again it's using forces of the air in, in a vacuum you could not curve a boomerang because there's no air resistance so inertia does not explain how something orbits another body you cannot have an inertial orbit um it only works for rotation and that's because again i don't know uh you seem to have missed the whole point about rigid bodies is in order for the earth to be the center of mass of the universe they have to be connected somehow even tenuously like if if they were connected by a string then you could say that they're one body and so what happens to the earth the earth can uh you know push or pull things along with it but again this doesn't make sense uh, if the Earth is the center of mass of a rotating body, then the Earth would be rotating and thus not stationary. So that, I mean, th this explanation debunks itself. Um, and, and your explanation of why the Earth is stationary, I ask, why is the Earth stationary? You say because the Earth is locked in place. So basically your answer to why the Earth is locked in place is that the Earth is locked in place. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, this this is kind of this is missing the fact that uh, the universe is not a rigid body that is connected to each other. They are separated by space. So uh, there's not again like these are uh, these are two separate objects. If I move one, the other doesn't have to move. But if I glued them together, they'd be one rigid body. And then both together, they would have a center of mass. Um, so, and you said it's transferring its forces all the way to the center of the universe. What forces and how is it transferring them? You seem to just kind of have this hand wave like, oh, the universe just transfers its force to the Earth. But uh, I'm trying to explore what do, you, what do you think these forces are? How are they transferring? How is the Earth being the center of a rigid object when they are not a rigid object? They are separate objects. Okay, Taylor, thank you for the five-minute second rebuttal. We're now going to hand it over to Robert. Robert, whenever you're ready, you also have five minutes. Go ahead. Great. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to start with your last question first. You said, what forces? I, I've said it twice already, and apparently you're not understanding it. The centrifugal and Coriolis forces are inertial forces that are caused by the angular momentum of the rotating universe, and they travel all over the universe. That's what keeps the stars in place, if you remember me saying that. Okay, so that's the force I'm talking about. And if you maybe you should read my books and find out all about it, you could go to Wikipedia and find out about it. Okay, now you said you couldn't find anywhere that the speed of light or mass could exceed C in your research. Let me read it to you. This is a book written by uh, the introduction to the theory of relativity by W.G. Rosser, 1964. Here's what he says. However, the restriction of C equals three times 10 to the eighth meters per second is restricted to the theory of special relativity. 
According to general relativity, it is possible to choose local reference frames in which over a limited volume of space, there is no gravitational field. And relative to such a reference frame, the velocity of light is equal to C. So he's agreeing that it could be C. However, this is not true when gravitational fields are present. In addition to the lengths of rods and the rates of clocks, the velocity of light is affected by a gravitational field. If gravitational fields are present, the velocities of either material bodies or of light can assume any numerical value, depending on the strength of the gravitational field. Now, here's where geocentrism comes in. If one considers the rotating Earth as being at rest, the centrifugal gravitational field assumes enormous values at large distances and is consistent with the theory of general relativity for the velocities of distant bodies to exceed 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second under these conditions. In other words, if you have a rotating universe, uh, the, the gravitational, the, the uh, centrifugal gravitational forces are so great out there that it highly affects the speed of light and mass. That's why those stars can go around the Earth in one day because we're not limited to the speed of light and mass, uh, uh, the speed of light at sea and mass not even be able to, uh, to go halfway to there at all uh, in our earthly environs, okay? Because the centrifugal and Coriolis forces are minimal here. But when you go out to the rim of the universe, um, they become tremendous, as the book just said, and that's where the speed of light can exceed sea by many factors, okay? All right. So you asked, you said, uh, I don't understand how an inertia is going to make a, a planet orbit. It doesn't. What's making the planet orbit is the fact that it has this property that makes it want to go in a straight line. That's called inertia. But then it has to deal with this sun who has a lot of gravity. So the gravity of the sun is going to pull that planet that wants to go in a straight line, but now it can't go in a straight line. It has to go in a curved line, okay? That's how it works. So, you know, so I'm not saying it's inertia. Inertia is just one property of the planet. Um, you say you can't push an object that, and that will make it curve. You can if you have a rotating universe, okay? Because the, the only way the, the universe is going is it's rotating in a curve. So obviously it's going to carry everything that's inside of it in a curve, Nothing's going to go straight. That's why we see it go around us every night. All right. Um, you said, what's connecting all this? Well, I just, I had gone through it. I said, space is not empty. That's what Einstein thought in his special relativity. And he did that so he could have light go at a constant speed. If you get rid of the ether, if you get rid of anything in space to, uh, uh, to retard the light, well, of course, it's going to go the same speed. But the fact is, we found out much more later on that space is made of something. And that's the connection between the inertial forces of the rotating universe and the center of mass. That's what locks it in place. It travels through this something, which quantum mechanics is still trying to figure out. What's the nature of this something? We know it's there. How do we describe it? And that's what they've been working on. Um the two objects you held up, the, your your phone and the uh, pencil holder, there's no gravity between them. There's nothing significant for, for one to be attracted to the other. But if you get big masses out there, like the sun and the earth and the, and the, and the planets and all that, well, yeah, now they're going to attract each other. And that gravity travels through something. It's not traveling through nothing. If there was nothing there, it wouldn't be able to travel through it. Robert, thank you very much for that five-minute rebuttal. Gentlemen, those were some fast-paced rebuttals. Again, excellent debate so far. And the audience is uh, sending in a lot of positive feedback, so I appreciate it. We're now moving into our open discussion. We've concluded the opening statements and our two rebuttals. We now have roughly 30 minutes on the clock for a free-flowing discussion. What we'll do since... Dr. Sinjanis just ended with his five-minute rebuttal. Taylor, why don't we give you the opportunity to pick the first point or the first topic to engage? Go ahead. 
Yeah, so I'm uh, pretty confident I understand your argument about inertia, um, but uh, the problem here is that you don't seem to understand the problems with it, uh, especially applied to uh, non-rigid objects or objects that aren't attached to each other. So you, you mentioned centrifugal and inertial forces. So centrifugal forces pretty much debunk your whole conception here. Centrifugal forces describe why objects will fly off a rotating object. And so they're not, they, they begin in a rotational uh, pathway, but they move away from that rotating object in a straight line. And, and you agree, you just said that inertia wants to make it go in a straight line. So I don't know why you keep ignoring that inertia doesn't keep objects locked in uh, orbital or curved pathways. Go ahead, Robert. Well, first of all, it's not just a centrifugal force, okay? Every movement has a centrifugal force and a Coriolis force as continuing forces, okay? If it was just centrifugal, yes, it would go out and fly out and never come back. The Coriolis force is the opposing force, but it's not um, linear. It's a curved force. If you do you know anything about the Coriolis force? Or, yeah, or a little talking? bit. Mostly. Well, yeah. you, need to, you need to know a lot about it. Okay. The Coriolis force is fundamental to movement. Okay. Uh, that's why people think the hurricanes travel, uh, well, not think, but they do. They travel left in the northern hemisphere and right in the southern hemisphere. Okay. What's making them do that? Well, so they call it a Coriolis effect. In geocentrism, it's a Coriolis force because that's what happens when you invert uh, by relativity the system wherein now you don't have a rotating Earth and a fixed universe. You have a fixed Earth and a rotating universe. When you do that, then you'll create centrifugal and Coriolis forces by the angular momentum of the universe. Do you understand that part? Yeah, but that doesn't explain how things get locked into a curved motion. They do because the universe is only going in one direction. It's going in a curved direction. So anything... That's not a direction. Curve is not a direction. Well, whatever you want to call it, okay? Well, in physics, in fact, a vector... Fact, I'll say it's moving in a curved, a curved uh, manner, if you want, okay? The fact is, if you're in the universe, you're going to move with it. And if it's rotating, you're going to rotate also. There's no other decision to be made. No, you could be moving against the universe. Yeah, but it you would be take moving opposite the direction of the objects that are moving in different directions. That's correct, but it would take a force to do that. Uh -huh. Okay, you would have to push that star by a some force so that it did not rotate with the universe, and that does happen sometimes. It's called proper motion of a star. There's thousands of them out there to have proper motion. But it's not great enough for us to detect by a telescope. So basically, they stay in the same position. But you can do that if you have a force. But I'm talking about no other forces except the centrifugal and Coriolis force of a rotating universe. If you in, have in no physics, other forces, they're going to go with the universe. In physics, you need a force in order to have a curve. In addition to the force That's right. that That's you're already exactly moving. That's what I'm saying. The universe so, is the force that keeps them the universe is not a force. That doesn't make sense. No, I didn't say the universe was a force. I said the rotation of the universe. When it when it creates, when it has angular momentum, it's going to create centrifugal and Coriolis forces. It's not the universe itself. Those forces act on all the bodies that are inside the universe. And if the universe is moving in a curved way, so are those bodies going to move in a curved way. How? Because how does how does a Coriolis force move. The make are... something keep curving? You need to keep applying right force. because the, it, cur you the, know, the force is always curving. I need to finish. Okay, um, go ahead. So you know how to calculate the path of a th like a thrown object, like a, a basic physics um, problem. You shoot a cannonball out of a cannon, and you have the vector of it going out of the cannon. Yeah, uh, so you I, need to add a downward vector from gravity as well, and that's where the curve comes from in the Newtonian system. So, yeah, but we're not talking about that right now. We're so talking where is, 
Newton didn't believe in a rotating universe. He believed the universe was irrelevant and couldn't move. I don't well, care what he believed or did not believe. It's irrelevant to a certain extent, but not to this extent. Because if you have a let's, – let's take a ball, okay, a solid – a bowling ball. All those particles in the bowling ball are going to move with that bowling ball if you rotate that bowling ball. Only if they're stuck to it and ma uh, make a rigid body. Right. But if and they're I'm not stuck to it, they will fly off of it due to the centrifugal force. If. But the centrifugal see it, The you, universe is again. not connected. It again. It's Our not planets are not connected to each other. I'm just going to jump in. I want to make sure that we can hear both sides. Robert, if you could reiterate your last couple points, and then we'll throw it right back to you, Taylor. No worries. Go, go ahead, Robert. All right. Well, they're going to be the same as, as, as what I was going to say, which is you keep harping on the centrifugal force, and that's because you don't understand the Coriolis force. Okay? The, the Coriolis force happens with the centrifugal force. It's an inward opposite force at twice the magnitude of the centrifugal force. That is what is acting on all the planets and stars to keep them moving with the rotating universe. You want to harp on centrifugal because you have an easy out now. You can say, well, they're going to fly off. And I'm telling you, they're not going to fly off because you're not dealing with a Coriolis force that brings them back. At where is the Coriolis force in a bunch of ro um, rotating galaxies? In a bunch of rotating galaxies. It's not the galaxies that are going to cr create that. It's the universe itself. This, the whole substance of the universe is rotating, just like that bowling ball was rotating. Your only explain, your only excuse to that was, well, they're not connected, you, they're not rigid, okay? And I'm telling you, they are rigid because space is not a nothing; it's a something, and that's what's connecting all these bodies. I could ask you the same thing about gravity. What is gravity traveling? How is gravity affecting anything? How is gra the gravity of uh, the sun affecting Jupiter? What is gravity? You have no explanation for that. And yet you want to try to pin me down. Huh? What do you mean I have no explanation for that? What does all that have you to do know is All you know is how fast an object will drop when you drop it on Earth, how fast it will go, and whether it has to reach, reach the escape velocity to get away from the Earth. That's all you know. You don't know what causes what? gravity. Oh, so you're saying like what the fundamental ontology of gravity is? Yeah. You know okay, what it is? I don't care. What do you mean we you can don't still care? describe how it works? Yeah, by math. And we that's don't, what we don't know what the fundamental ontology of anything is, really, of even mass. All right. So then why are you harping so it, on the body then? Okay. Why, because why that's, you... that's where the inertial uh, conservation of momentum for rotation applies. It doesn't apply to two disconnected objects. You can't have a center of gravity between two unconnected objects. I agree. And I'm okay, telling so you, why connected. are you saying the, the Earth is because the center of gravity connected. of the universe? Because you're working on the paradigm that space is nothing and can't connect anything. I'm working on the paradigm that it is something and the forces are traveling right through that something to the other object. What force? The centrifugal and the Coriolis force. Are that's just zapping through space somehow. That's, that? that's not how either of those forces work. Wait a minute. You asked me what they were, and I just told you what they were, and you said what? <laughs> that, that's not how either of those work. They don't just zap through space like some sci-fi laser beam. I didn't say they were a sci-fi laser beam. Don't try to caricature it. It's not going to get you out of the problem. The it problem is a caricature. Is the, how, how would centrifugal force travel otherwise in your system? It's uh, it's not zapping through space through uh, hundreds of thousands of light years. Oh, really? It's, it's so, so the way that, yeah, the way that centrifugal force works in real physics is that when there's a rotating object, it applies of uh, acceleration to an object on it and it flings it in a certain direction and it keeps moving in that direction because it's okay, not connected. So you, because so you and I there. agree. The rotating yeah. object here is the whole universe. That's what you don't like. You no, like but, little balls that you can control, but you don't want to apply it to the whole universe. Uh, no, because if something is set in a rotation it's and it's going to fly off due to centrifugal force, it's not curving still. It's just flying off in a straight right, line. That's right, because you don't have a Coriolis force in there. If you the, have Coriolis Coriolis force force, is, the Coriolis force is on the rotating object, not the object that flew off of it. 
no, that's not the way it works. Yeah, it no, is exactly that's not how it the works. way it works. If you if you are on a uh, like I say a, a spinning carousel, and uh, there's four people, east, west, north, and south, and you're all and you're throwing a ball back and forth to each other, and this carousel is spinning as you're trying to throw it. What direction is that ball going to go in if you try to throw it to the guy directly across from you? Sorry, can you say that again? You're on a spinning carousel. You got four people mm -hmm. at four corners, okay? North, east, south, and west. You have a ball, beach ball. And you and as the carousel is spinning, you throw this beach ball to the guy directly across from you. What is that? On ball? the carousel. Yeah. What what direction is that ball going to go in? Is it going to reach that guy over the next right right across from you? Not if you throw it straight. Not if you throw it straight. Because you're both moving. So wherever no, it's say, gonna leave, you, 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 you both are moving in position. It's like you know, you, you have to shoot where someone is moving toward, not where they are. Okay, so you're throwing it straight to him. That's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. You're throwing it straight to him. Which direction is that ball going to go in? Is it well, going to I, go straight to him or not? That's the question. Depending on where you throw it. You're we need to know the direction across. of rotation. We'd need to know a no, few you don't other make, things. You don't need to make this complicated. You're throwing it straight across to him. To where he is. He, in hopes that he will catch it. it yeah, it's, it's not going to hit him. That's right. And you know what they call that? The Coriolis force. Okay? okay. That's what makes the pendulum, the Foucault pendulum, go around. Okay, uh -huh. there's a force on that pendulum. So, so you're you're trying to make the distinction between the object and the stuff that throws that that is thrown out from the object. You can't do that. So help me out. How does that fact mean that a galaxy traveling in a certain uh, velocity will suddenly change directions and toward the Earth? The galaxy is not traveling in a certain speed. Okay, it's traveling with the universe. If it has a proper motion, that's all its own. How okay. can it travel without any speed? Because the universe is forcing it to. It's the whole thing. If the universe revol uh, rotates, what? so is everything inside of it going to rotate. You're How? just saying it, you, it you is. That that was it is. You said that that was impossible because there's nothing connecting them. But I'm telling you there is. Because space is not nothing. It's a something. Just like your gravity can travel through space, so can the inertial forces travel through space. But you're just using these words as like fillers, like the force just travels through space, but there's no mechanism there. Well, so does your I don't understand travel through space. Of course, you yeah. You I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it can't travel through space, but it sounds like you're just using these like kind of filler words and saying it just goes through space, but you're not describing how well, it what works. What else would I say? Where else is it going to go? If it's going to affect the galaxy, of course it has to go through space. Why well, would that just, just be a filler? It's just kind of empty, like uh, just filler words. You just said the Earth is locked in position because it's locked in position. There's no, no explanation no, of why. No, no, I There's no explanation of what what uh, acceleration, what force is going through, and how it actually works. You're just saying the Coriolis force. Well, no, you could replace that with literally is, anything, and you're is, still you saying you, nothing. You need to go look at the equations. Okay, look at the what equation. equation? The equations of motion when you stop from a linear to an accelerated frame, okay? They use, centrifugal, it, they, they use centrifugal, Coriolis, and Euler forces. It's a standard equation. All I'm doing is it applying to the rotating universe. That's all I'm doing. The problem is you don't understand what the Coriolis force is, okay? And then you, you accuse me of using filler words, and that's because you don't understand it. No wonder it's a filler word to you. Uh, it's because it's completely inapplicable to objects uh, orbiting other objects. No, it's not inapplicable. Okay. You really need to study the physics on this. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I have studied the physics on no, this. No, you haven't. I can tell. Yeah, I have. Okay. I can tell you haven't studied it. You don't even, you don't <laughs> even know what general relativity I can is. tell. That, that's a great argument. Um, so, but you're still not explaining anything about this. Pretend that I know not. nothing about it. I, I you take know something about it. One you, day know, of physics. you know, you know a little bit about explain, it. But that's about it. Yeah, explain how the Coriolis effect is causing objects to be locked into an orbit. 
I didn't say the Coriolis force was causing objects to be locked in an orbit. I said it was a combination of the centrifugal, Coriolis, and Euler forces that are generated by a rotating universe. I, I understand you would that. know that if you knew the equation that they use when they go from a, an inertial frame to a non-inertial frame. That's the standard equation. And that's all I'm doing. No, no, it's not. Standard physics oh is actually gosh. against everything that you've said here right now. No, it's not. It, it is, which is why all the physicists disagree with you. So, no, they don't. No, because they all okay. admit so that the geocentric universe is a um, viable universe. They just don't prefer it. They know the math from Einstein's general relativity allows it. But they're not going to say, yeah, that's the one we prefer, geocentric universe, for the very reason you started your speech in the first place. Because they want to be insignificant. They want to right, be out because, there. Because you can program, using the math, you could program uh, things to move in any way you want uh, from any reference frame you want. And it's fine. But the, the reason that your model doesn't work at all in under our physics is because of these energetic concerns. And you're just made up forces your, your, your that question have no already, mechanism whatsoever. So you're your, still, your question you cut about me off energy. before and you're cutting me off now. I need you to explain well, we'll to me with one like, subject, I, okay? like I've taken don't, don't one day in subjects. physics and tell me how the combination of the centrifugal force, Coriolis effect, and, or, uh, and Euler force are causing the universe to stay in a locked orbit you, you've thrown out these terms, the and universe. you said that they just do, but you're not explaining how. Because it's a force, and a force moves objects. More emptiness. You're just saying it moves That's objects. Physics. I'm asking you how it moves it in this particular way, and your answer is it moves objects. No, I said that that exactly the universe is said. rotating, and the, the inertial forces, which are the centrifugal Coriolis and Euler forces, are rotating with it. And they're going to affect every object that is inside the universe to go in the same curve that the universe is. How much better can I explain that to you? What you um, need to any do. Any amount of explanation would be better. I just gave it to you. Okay. What, you what's happening you here is do. you don't know what the inertial forces are and how they work. That's you what you should have said. Yeah, that's a like, really bad you're debate it, tactic. You're making it, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You're making it plainly evident. I had to educate you what the Coriolis force was. You didn't tell me anything I didn't know. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Did you? You didn't say anything, really. You're oh, just okay. saying you're just saying yeah. these words, and then you're saying it makes it work, but you're not saying how it works. Uh, that's because you don't understand what I said. So, okay. No, it's because you uh, haven't explained it. If, if you gentlemen don't mind. We just hit about the 20 minute mark. I'm trying to follow as best as I, I can. A very technical subject, very interesting. Maybe we should shift to Robert. And if you had a specific question or challenge for Taylor, maybe we can uh, spend some time on, on a new point. But it's totally up to you, gentlemen. I do want to keep it free flowing, of course. All right. Let's talk about the Michelson Morley experiment because I think you did a misrepresentation on that. Um, when Michelson Morley used their. Uh, light interference principle in their interferometer uh, to measure whether there was a significant difference between a light beam going north and south as opposed to one going uh, east and west. What did they find in the results? Uh, that there was no ether? No. See, that's how you misrepresented it. That's what they said themselves. That no. The experiment... Here failed. Yeah. The experiment on the relative motion of the Earth and ether have been completed and the result decidedly negative. That's a quote. Now, you know what else they said? They said that would be true if the Earth was standing still. We wouldn't have measured an ether using our equipment. Why? Because if the Earth isn't moving through the ether, they're going to get a null result. Okay. So what they got was a null result, but they believed that the earth was moving. That was the fundamental assumption going into that experiment, that the earth was moving. So if the earth is moving and you don't get a, the result that you expected for the ether, what are you going to conclude? What are you going to conclude? Well, there must be no ether then. Instead of saying 
well, maybe the Earth actually isn't moving through the ether. And that's why we got a null result. Okay. okay? But they, they didn't that's want that. So that's why I'm saying you misrepresented the experiment by thinking that their conclusion was ipso facto correct. No. The whole debate surrounds on how you interpret the Michelson-Morley experiment. Okay? So Einstein comes along and says, all right, so let's get rid of the ether, and that way we can keep light constant and answer the Michelson-Morley experiment that showed no ether. Well, because there is no ether. But he didn't know that. All yeah, he knew was that he got a null result in the experiment. That's it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so there's no... All the variations on... on uh ether wind or ether drag that was soundly disproven okay so now they've ad hoc decided to change the ether hypothesis to the earth is stationary and the ether is also stationary no reason to believe that because it's not even necessary for any of the calculations so that's where you're at you just have this hypothesis that has no experimental demonstration oh, and wait, no wait. mathematical necessity <laughs> look who's talking you're the one, your side is drawing the conclusion that if the earth doesn't, if, if our experiment doesn't measure an ether drift, that means there's no ether. Talk about somebody who's assuming something. You don't know that. No, they concluded that there's no ether wind or right. ether drag. Yeah, same thing as ether drift, okay? If there's no ether drift, you can't assume that that's the case because there's no ether. The equally viable explanation uh -huh. to that experiment is the Earth isn't moving through the ether. That's why you didn't measure any. Sure. But nobody and... wanted to talk about that. Why? Well, because Copernicus told us that the Earth is moving around the sun. And we just take that as gospel. That's our foundation. Nobody's proved it, but we just take that. Why? Well, because we don't want to kiss the, the feet of the Pope who told us that Galileo was wrong. That's why. Uh, no, at, at no point did any of these scientists mention the, not wanting to kiss the feet of the Pope. Well, I know. Um, I'm just being a little rhetorical here, okay? Yeah. Bear with me, all right? In other words, they didn't want so, the Earth to stand still. Why? Because that would put them right in the center of the universe. And that means... Not, not, why, else, why are you now arguing toward the motiva motivations that you couldn't possibly know? They didn't want it to be that way, so they just made up all this science that way because Let's i talk read about the actual results of the science i just did is, and now i'm adding now you're they, now you're now adding what they, what they said right. in their books all right I, i'm they, gonna need to be able why to they don't like things. the earth to be in the center they said this in their book like for example when hubble discovered the redshift of the galaxies he, okay, he, we've, he we've had several I'm points gonna, now where I'm i haven't want to give you an analogy comments. okay I'm just going to give you an analogy. You're asking me why I can read the minds of these guys because they say it in their books. That's why Hubble was uh -huh. one of them that is very explicit about it. When he saw the redshift of the galaxies, he, he said, Oh my gosh, this shows that the earth is in the center of the universe, but we can't have that. That's horrible. That is something that we'll do as a last resort. This is in his 1937 book. Okay. So he's telling you, he's telling, huh? Is that a quote? There are six of them. You can read them all in my book. Okay. okay. So he said he used the word horrible, not acceptable, as used as a last resort. Those three I remember. Okay. So what did he do? He didn't like the earth in the center. So he, he made, he just, he uh, invented the balloon universe and he put the earth and the galaxies all on the surface of the balloon and nothing's in the center anymore. That's how, that's how he got rid of the center with the earth in it. Okay. So I know what the motivations of these guys are. Okay, it's not there just you know. all science. Um, you're, you're mind reading now. And uh, badly at, at I that. I told you what he so, said. Uh, so going back three or four points where you, you kind of railroaded me. The, uh, you said that, um, that there is one last model of ether left, which is that the ether is stationary, the earth is stationary. Sure, but there's no experiment. You don't have any experimental evidence to show that that actually is the case. It's just I kind never of said impossible, it. right? Because I never said it. I never said there was a stationary ether and a stationary Earth. That was Lorenz's little uh, try, and he failed. Okay? So Michelson you don't agree with that? No. So the is Michelson, the ether moving? 
I, I agree the ether is moving. The reason why is because the then, universe is moving with the ether in it. Okay, so then we should detect an ether wind for, uh, effect. We did. It's called the Michelson Gale experiment, 1925. They that found one failed full, too. Huh? That one failed too. No, it didn't fail. They found a full sidereal rotation of 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.1 seconds. How could that yeah. happen unless something's moving against something else? So what? What do you conclude from that? They concluded the opposite. They didn't know what to conclude because they believed the Earth was moving around the sun and the Earth was rotating. They went into that experiment with the same assumption that Michelson went into his other experiment in 1887. So they're not going to come up with a geocentric explanation, but I can. Why? Because I believe the universe with its ether is rotating around the Earth once a day. And that's how Michelson Gale would get a one-day ether drift. Very, it's very easy. But you can't uh, actually um, disambiguate that from a, a heliocentric model. Either. Sure, I can. You know why? Because the Michelson, Michelson Morley experiment didn't show a revolution of the earth. Okay. But the Which Michelson, we, wait, hold on a second. The Michelson Gale experiment showed a rotation, but the heliocentric system needs both a revolution around the sun and it needs a rotation of the earth. If it doesn't have both, then the theory is falsified. Michelson Morley didn't find a revolution but they did find a rotation, but they need both. Geocentrism only needs one. All it needs is a rotation. And that's explained by the universe rotating around a fixed earth. So it seems that you can't reconcile Michelson Morley and Michelson Gale. Because I just did. <laughs> you didn't though. There's contradictions there. How? Where? Because Tell me. if I, uh, if you would let me speak, I would say that. I'm letting you speak. Go. Um, so if you don't detect any rotation um, in the Michelson-Morley experiment, you yet... Mean revolution. You mean revolution, not rotation. Revolution. Okay. Uh, then the ether is not moving, or you're not moving through the ether, because... Again, using uh, the reference okay, frame of I'll the Earth, that. it I'll doesn't actually that. matter whether or not the Earth or the uh, the ether is moving. There should, it, again, from relativity, it doesn't matter whether your reference frame is the ether or your reference frame is the Earth. If I one agree. of them is rotating or moving, you should detect an ether wind effect. And so one experiment, right. you can't reconcile both of these experiments. Yes, I can, because the rotation is different than a revolution, okay? If the Earth isn't revolving around the sun, but it's rotating on its axis, you're going to get an ether drift in the Michelson-Gale experiment. Isn't that correct? Say again? If the Michelson-Morley showed that there's no revolution because there was no ether drift, okay, then how are you going to explain that the Michelson-Gale experiment did show a full ether drift for a rotation. But that's that's what I'm saying, is if they measured a an ether drift, then the ether and the Earth both, both must be uh, stationary, right? No. If the ether's stationary and the Earth is stationary, there is no ether drift. But you just said that they measured an ether drift. In the Michelson-Gale experiment. So you okay. can't reconcile them. No, uh, sure they I can. Ether. You're the one who can't reconcile them because you need both a revolution, that is, you need an ether drift in the Michelson-Morley experiment, and you need an ether drift in the Michelson-Gale experiment. But you don't have one in the Michelson-Morley experiment. You only have one in the Michelson-Gale no, so I don't you don't have the two components of your system. You need a revolution and a rotation. You only have one rotation. Uh, no, because we're not under the heliocentric model. We're not measuring uh, ether. So 
That's it's sure. just what irrelevant. What do you think the Michelson Morley yeah. experiment was all about? It was about measuring ether. Right. The way they dealt with it is trying to measure. Wait a minute. They said the way we'll deal with it is not by allowing the earth to stay fixed. We're going to get rid of the ether. That'll solve the problem. But then when they did the Michelson Gale experiment, they found a full ether drift for a rotation. So if there's no ether, how are you going to get ether in the Michelson Gale experiment? Uh, that's the point. They're not reconcilable. For you, they're not reconcilable. That means your heliocentric oh. theory is falsified. I can reconcile them because I only need a rotation. I need a full rotation per day. And I can get it by either the Earth rotating in a fixed ether or the ether going around a fixed Earth. You have a problem because you, you don't have ether in the Michelson-Morley experiment, according to Einstein. But now you got ether in the Michelson-Gale experiment because you got a full ether drift. So it's irreconcilable for you, not for me. Uh, no, it's it's completely compatible with uh, special relativity. Yeah, we'll talk about filler. You're just saying words now to defend your position. You're not giving me any explanation whatsoever. Uh, how, I, how is it incompatible with special relativity? Jeez. Oh, special relativity says there's no ether. Okay? But you found an ether right. drift in Michelson-Gale experiment. Well, no, they found an angular velocity of the Earth. By, by, by using the, the principle of light interference with ether. It's the same principle that Michelson Morley used in 1887. Nothing changed. The only thing they changed was the orientation of the pipes. That's all they did. It was the same principle. And they and so they said, well, there's, there's no ether in Michelson Morley. Okay, and that's why, you know, we, we got a null result. But then they come to Michelson Gale, and they and something is making this uh, one thing one thing move against the other. And they say, well, we don't know what the, exactly the, the reason is for this. It may be because the ether is stationary with the Earth. That was Lorenz's expl explanation. Okay, so until you can explain how you can have no ether in Michelson Morley and then have a, a, a full result uh, based on ether in Michelson Gale, you, you don't have any explanation at all. Michelson Gale. Yeah, I'm going to hey, Taylor, we're going to hand it to you for a response. Then we'll hand it back to Robert for a final response. Cause if I remember correctly, you started the discussion, Taylor, as we are now past the 30 minute mark for the discussion. Time has flown by. I do appreciate you both keeping it fast paced, very engaging and uh, just free flowing. I appreciate it. So Taylor, go ahead. Feel free to respond. We'll throw it back to Robert, and then we'll jump into closing statements. Yeah, Michelson and Gale said that the experiment is compatible with both the idea of stationary ether and special relativity. Um, not compatible with a rotating ether, but... Uh, um, and then Einstein demonstrated that ether was not necessary for any of these equations or predictions to be made. Um, and so, no, the, the results are not dependent upon an ether being true as you tried to say um so i'm not sure so you again you still have no actual positive evidence for your model of ether you just have um, a couple of things that are maybe consistent with it but it's also consistent with special relativity so it, it actually doesn't do any work for you my turn <laughs> yes robert go ahead and then the next response from you taylor will be your five minute concluding statement so robert go ahead all right so the Michelson Morley experiment, 1887, was based on finding ether drift. Okay, that's that's a given. Nobody can argue with that. the The principle was if a light beam is going to go through ether, and either uh, if a light beam is going to go through ether, and it's going to go through at an extra velocity, which they uh, said was the movement of the Earth around the sun then there's going to be a difference in the speed between one light beam and the other light beam, all based on whether ether was there. Okay. So now we come to uh, Michelson Gale, 1925, same principle. The interferometer is based on ether. As a matter of fact, they even took the air out of the pipes just to make sure. And now they find that there is movement. The exact movement that you would want to calculate for a rotation 
a sidereal rotation, 23 hours, 56 minutes. Okay. That machine was based on finding ether drift, ether resistance, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't going to measure anything else. Okay. Just the ether. And, and they found a movement. But they, but the, and please understand this. The previous experiment was also based on ether, and they found no movement for the revolution of the Earth around the sun. Okay? And now you're telling me, oh, well, special relativity can explain Michael Singel, but special relativity doesn't believe in ether. And yet both interferometers were based on, based on measuring the ether, nothing else. They weren't measuring microwaves or anything else. They were measuring ether. Okay, so you can't just say, oh, well, special relativity can answer that. No, it can't. It doesn't even believe in ether. So something's wrong here. Very wrong. You got two experiments that are based on ether and special relativity that's not. Oh, but that can explain everything. Just change the frames. Yeah, sure. That's that's what it does all the time. But but uh, ask ask them to consider that the reason Michelson and Morley didn't measure an ether drift was because the Earth was standing still in space? Oh, well, we can't have that. We can't have that. But then Einstein had to eat his words 10 years later when he invented general relativity, which said, yes, the, ge the geocentric universe is viable and it's scientifically explainable. His own theory said that, okay? But no, we can't have we can't have the Earth stay still. That would just bring us back to the primitive time of the medievals. You know, we can't have that, even though it's a viable explanation. That's what this whole thing's about. Okay, Robert, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Great, fast-paced discussion, incredibly interesting debate. So this is awesome. Okay, Snake, we're going to hand it over to you for a five-minute concluding statement. So this is a good uh, opportunity and time to kind of wrap up our thoughts, points, and address anything that we feel may be left hanging. And so, Taylor, please, whenever you're ready, just let me know. And you've got a full five minutes. All right. So the uh, the main problems here were pretty much left unaddressed. Um, uh, I think the the most um, emblematic example of this was when asked uh, what keeps the Earth stationary because gravity, and this wasn't addressed at all at any point, um, but uh, it was the most emblematic of the emptiness of the answers is what keeps the Earth stationary? Um, it's locked in place. So you're just answering the question with what the question is. If How is it locked in place? Because it's locked in place. Uh, most of the answers were exactly like that. Um, what, how does the, uh, how do the inertial forces cause a, a constant acceleration um, in a, an orbit fashion around the earth? Well, because the forces travel through space and just do it. Uh, no explanation of how they actually do this. So uh, let's go through why each one of these excuses fails. Um, the centrifugal force is, um, I mean, these are all fictitious forces. They aren't actual uh, forces that uh, make an object move. They are apparent forces, um, but uh, that's another can of worms. Um, so the centrifugal force is when an object is spinning and uh, other objects that are on it, which aren't connected to it, uh, fly off in a straight line doesn't explain uh, curvature, uh, movement curvature, uh, curved movement, sorry. Um, you need two vectors for curved movement. We don't have that with the centrifugal force. Coriolis force, um, it, essentially when you're on a rotating body uh, and you're moving in a straight line, since it's rotating, it's going to appear as if you're actually moving in a curve. Still, it doesn't explain how entire galaxies are uh, having uh, energy out of nowhere, moving them faster than the speed of light, uh, again, in an orbit around the Earth. The, these are not connected at all. He never even attempted to connect them, just said, I don't know what I'm talking about, didn't show why. Um, and that was the whole substance of it. Uh, the, the Euler force, 
basically, again, is inertia. Um, imagine you're on a carousel spinning. When it starts, you're going to be pulled back. Uh, same as if you're in a car moving in a straight line, but if you're spinning, if you uh, when the carousel stops, you're going to move forward. But uh, imagine if the carousel was spinning extremely fast and stopped suddenly and you fly off. Would you fly off and start orbiting the carousel? No, you would fly off in a straight line because a, the uh, a orbital pattern needs constant change in acceleration. You constantly have to adjust um, that that second vector because you you still have the conserva conservation of uh, momentum from your initial movement, uh, but you need to add another vector in order to start moving in a curved direction and you need it to constantly change which is why orbiting around a body uh, like uh, via gravity that works because gravity is constantly um, forcing it toward that center point no matter what point you are around it of course if you're uh, close enough to the object um and you know we got bogged down on the ether experiments which um you conclude the exact opposite of what uh, the actual experimenters conclude on most of these things. Um, they concluded that it, that the Michelson uh, Gale Pearson experiment is consistent with either uh, model, which doesn't really get you anywhere. Um, evidence consistent with something is not evidence for something. Um, and then you're a saving line for that was that these experiments were based on ether. Well, that's that's not true at all. They were trying to prove ether that, and um, other scientists like Einstein discovered that you could make these same predictions without ether. So you don't need to have ether in any of these equations. So they're not based on ether. They can work by different principles. They weren't based on ether. They were trying to measure ether, which they couldn't conclusively do at any point. The closest you can get is it's it's consistent with ether, but then you have uh, discrepancies with that as well. So we didn't get any answer to why the heavenly bodies move the way that they do where the or especially where this energy comes from and especially why the earth stands still when he agrees that gravity would work on the earth and uh i think i've run out of time okay taylor thank you very much for that five minute closing statement since we now only have one more five minute closing statement before the audience q a to our audience please do uh send in your questions this is basically your Final five minutes to send in a question for the Q&A. So with that, uh, Dr. Robertson, Janice, whenever you're ready, you've got five minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, let me let me try to deal with what he said here, because that would be my concluding issues as well. <clears throat> he, he's still questioning where the energy comes from. I already explained that several times. Somebody has to push the universe to get it started. Once it starts, its own inertia keeps it going ad infinitum. Okay, there's the energy issue. Yeah, he is still puzzled about what keeps the Earth stationary um, because he just doesn't understand or doesn't want to understand how these inertial forces created by the rotating universe are going to keep objects in their place, especially the center of mass. I mean, you can even use Newtonian physics to understand that the center of mass doesn't move. So if the Earth, Earth occupies the center of mass, it's not going to move. OK, and and the other forces that are there are going to keep it locked in. I'm not I didn't say, well, it's locked in because it's locked in. I mean, I wouldn't be that crass about the whole thing. Um, I, I explained many times that the inertial forces keep the Earth locked in place, just like it keeps the stars and everything else in the universe locked in place as they rotate with the universe, unless there's another force that hits one of those galaxies it's not going to move it's just going to keep rotating with the universe i don't know how, why that's so hard to understand um he says inertial forces just travel through space well what else are they going to travel through what does gravity travel through it travels through space doesn't it it's a force isn't it 
So he believes a force can travel through space. He just has he just calls it gravity. I'm calling it inertial forces, and they do exist. Okay, if you if you had the reciprocal of Einstein's uh, a universe that is geocentric, the inertial forces are real. They're not fictitious. Okay, that's something else he needs to brush up on. Uh, he kept, he kept saying, yeah, well, they're just fictitious forces. Anyway, we don't have to worry about. It. And yet he starts talking about the centrifugal force as if it's going to upset the whole geocentric universe because it's going to travel off into space in a straight line. Okay, but he doesn't consider the Coriolis force is the very force that's going to balance out the centrifugal force at twice the magnitude and hold it right where it is so that it doesn't go off into space. I mean, if I hadn't figured that out, I mean, went through 20 years of study geocentrism and this was hanging in my face, the, the centrifugal force is, is going to disrupt your whole thing and I hadn't figured out how to solve that. Do you think I'd be here tonight? No. The problem is he doesn't understand how the Coriolis and centrifugal force work together. That's the issue. And he won't let them travel sp through space, but he'll let his gravity travel through space. That's okay, because that supports his system. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, he's talking about the orbit requires two vectors. Well, that's exactly what the centrifugal and the Coriolis force are, and the Euler force. There are actually three vectors involved. When, when you look at the physics equation that's used for this, they're all vectors, okay? And when you combine them all, that's how you get the object to, to orbit. Um, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. There are a couple, let me see. Oh, he says that I conclude the exact opposite of what the scientists conclude of the Michelson Morley experiment and the Michelson Gala, Gala experiment. Well, <laughs> That's why we're here, aren't we? They have one interpretation because they want to support heliocentrism. That's their preferred system. It's not because they proved it. You even said yourself that the evidence is consistent, but that doesn't make it right. Well, of course. Okay? But it, what it does is this. It now opens the door that's been closed for hundreds of years to geocentrism. Because now we have the science from Einstein himself that allows us to teach it as a scientific proposition that's viable. Before, with Newton and everybody else, oh, no, geocentric, that's dead. You know, Ptolemy, all those guys, they're dead. We don't believe that stuff anymore, okay? But then 200 years after Newton, things changed. Ernst Mach came along and Einstein came along, and now geocentrism is viable again. So now we have a viable interpretation of the Michelson Morley experiment that wasn't accepted before because nobody wanted the earth to stand still in the, in the center of the universe. That's why. But now that things are changing and we realize that, hey, it is viable, so let's fight for it. And that's what I'm doing tonight. Dr. Sengenis, thank you very much for your concluding statement. <laughs> and... Okay, guys, that concludes opening statements, rebuttals, discussion, and concluding statements. Fantastic debate. Lots of great feedback from the audience with a ton of great questions for us to engage. Uh, quick mm -hmm. reminder before we get into the audience questions. Um, tomorrow, actually, firstly, I'll just kind of plug uh, next month, we'll be having uh, Dr. Roberts and Jen is back here for a Flat Earth debate, Flat Earth on trial. So I know I know a lot of people are excited for this. I'm excited for this as well. He'll be debating uh, Nathan Erickson. And so there's something that our guests tonight, I believe, agree on. So there's some common agreements there. Pumped for that one. Uh, tomorrow, we've got another main event. All week, we've had uh, end of summer uh, main event. So tomorrow night, we'll be back here at 8 for an assumption of Mary debate. So we've got all seasoned debaters for this one. William Albrecht and Sam Shamoon taking on Turretin Finn and Dan Chapa. This one's going to be excellent. So make sure you're here for that. It'll kick off at uh, ADST. So, okay, gentlemen, Robert and Taylor, are we all good to go on some audience questions? Good to go. Yeah. Okay. And, and Nate, Nathan's a great guy, but I'll be rooting for you in that one, Robert. <laughs> okay, thanks. 
I appreciate Actually, that. Taylor, I think you've debated Nathan in the past, haven't oh, you? Oh, yeah, a few times, yeah. Well, there you go. He, he's sure he's a great t- person to talk to, even, even if I don't agree. Well, make sure you're tuned in for that one. It's going to be a good one. Okay, gentlemen, so let's get right into some of these questions. I have a feeling these this Q&A period is going to be comprehensive <laughs> and in many ways continue the debate that we've been engaging in. So, okay, let's start with our uh, first question for tonight. And it comes in from, here we go, Born Again RN. And Steve Christie, as a matter of fact, Robertson Jennis and Steve Christie have debated in the past. Uh, firstly, he wants to thank you, Dr. Sinjenis, for the DVD. It says, God bless. And a uh, question for both. Do other solar systems with stars and planets in them have stars that rotate around planets? Okay, so r- rather than most, qu- uh, most questions tonight that are kind of directed at someone specific, this one is just a general question for the both of you. And so, um, you know what, Taylor, why don't we start with you since Robert ended uh, last in terms of the concluding statement. So we'll allow you to speak first if you'd like. Um, I simple answer is just yes. And uh, the, uh, I guess the extrapolation from that would be, uh, so why is our star special? And it's actually not special other than the Earth. We have planets that rotate around the sun uh, in the geocentric model, but for some reason, the Earth is just uh, accepted from that. Okay, thank you, Taylor. Robert, floor is yours. Well, if your planet, and it's, the Earth would not be a planet because a planet is something that moves, um, but just the, if the Earth is in the center of mass of the universe, then obviously everything's going to re- be revolving around it. There's just no other way to look at it. And since most of the universe is made of stars, we're going to see them go around us every night. Okay. Now, um, if you are on, let's say, Jupiter, and Jupiter rotates, okay, um, you're going to see the stars go around you every night. Why? Because Jupiter rotates. Okay. But that's not, I don't think that's the basis of the question. The question was formed by asking other planets that, don't rotate are they going to see the the stars revolving around them no they're not yeah i mean you may see something partially depending on where that planet is in the universe the closer it is to the center of mass the more you're going to see the stars revolve around you every night like let's say uh let's say mars let's say if if it doesn't rotate is going to see the stars revolve around it every night just like the earth does except it's going to be at a slightly different angle. That's all. So in other words, the closest, closer you are to the center of mass, the more you're going to see all the stars uh, revolving around you every night. The further away you are, the less that's going to be the case. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Since this is a question for both, to be fair, what we can do is, Taylor, we can allow you a one-minute response to anything uh, that you'd like to respond to. Then we'll throw it right back to Robert and Dennis. He gets the final minute. And then we'll move to the next question. So, Taylor, go ahead. You get How many questions card. do you have, Donnie? Um, well, with the amount of questions we have, we'll never be able to get through them all. We've got a ton. Well, I, I would suggest this. If, if um, my, my uh, de- debating op- opponent will agree, is this is sort of a trivial question. And uh, we can go to other questions that are much more serious. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yep. yeah we I, can don't definitely mean, do. I don't mean to ridicule the questioner. I'm just saying we've already answered it so we can move on. Fully yeah. agree. Okay. Gentlemen, whatever you both, I just want to make sure you both feel like you're getting adequate time to respond to, to points. So, okay, we'll go to the next question. Uh, here we go. Um, this one comes in from CC. Question for Robert. How do you know the author of Psalm 96 that says the earth will not be moved intended a precise scientific description instead of a phenomenological description about the sun rising um well let's put it this way even a geocentrist believes that the sun rises and sets okay because that's what he sees he doesn't go out to his wife and say gee look at that beautiful revolution of the earth we're having today he says look at that beautiful sunset 
Okay. So we use phenomenological, phenomenological language all the time, and even the Bible does. Okay. Like when the Bible says the sun sets and the sun rising, it's it's using phenomenological, phenomenological language. Okay. Because technically speaking, the sun is not rising or setting. The sun is moving, and it happens to be moving against the horizon from the observer's point of view. Okay. So if you get to the technical side of the question and you say, okay, you, you look at the sunset as phenomenological, but when you get to the question of what's making it look like it's rising or setting, now we have two different answers. The one answer is, well, the earth is rotating. The other answer is the sun is moving around the earth against the horizon, wherever the observer is, and he's going to see as if the sun is setting. Okay. So scientifically, you got two different answers. Phenomenologically, you're both saying the same thing. So that's how we would explain that. Now, the question here is, when I look at Psalm 96, why do I say that that is a literal um, moving or not moving of the earth? Well, because when you take everything the Bible says about this issue, and we've already touched upon the phenomenological issues, but when you touch upon all the other passages that talk about the earth not moving, and in one of them, Psalm 93, it compares God's immutability to the earth not moving. Now, that's significant. That's in the context. In other words, God is trying to use an analogy to show why he doesn't change, why he's immutable. And he uses the fact that the earth doesn't move as his analogy. Now, if that's the case, then we are inclined much more to interpret that passage literally than we would just phenomenologically, okay, because of the context of the passage. Another context, and I, I hope I'm not taking too much time from you, but um, when we read of passages like Joshua 10, where Joshua stopped the sun and the moon for one day, um, you can't answer that technically or scientifically by saying that the earth stopped rotating. Because if that was the case, the sun may stop if the earth stopped rotating in the heliocentric system, but the moon would keep on going because the moon moves independently of the sun. As a matter of fact, in about five to 10 hours, it would be dip into the Mediterranean Sea before the 24 hours was over. Okay. So the only way you can answer that historically unless you're just going to say the whole thing's a myth, and some people do that. But if you're going to answer it historically for what the text gives you, the only way to answer that is by saying that the sun and moon both had to be stopped because they both move independently so that there would be 24 hours extra. Okay. So when I see passages like that, and then I go look at Psalm 96, I have some verification now that I'm on the right track in interpreting Psalm 96 in a literal fashion. Thank you for the response. Uh, Robert Taylor, floor is yours. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm, I don't have much commentary on the Bible as a reference itself here, but I guess I'll use my time to kind of point out um, something odd that I noticed through, through the debate is, uh, Robert, you took uh, uh, umbrage with scientists who you think have this sort of bias against this literal interpretation of the Bible, and they're motivated to make scientific conclusions for their preferred system. But it seems like you're doing exactly the same thing, that this is your preferred system. Um, you explicitly said your motivation is to protect Catholicism. So it, it seems like from your own standards and your, your own um, criticisms, it seems like you would have motivated conclusions that if I have to throw out the conclusions of these scientists because of what you say their motivations are, how can I not do the same for yours? Okay, I will answer. Because when I read their books, and I'm talking about Einstein, Hubble, Ernst Mach, Newton, all of them, this is the drift I get from them that the last thing they want is for the earth to be in the center of the universe. I mean, even Hawking, Stephen Hawking, 
in his recent book, what was it, what's it called? 2010, he wrote it, The Something Illusion, I forget, but on page 43, he says, look, we can't tell whether Ptolemy was correct or Copernicus was correct. He admits that up front, but he said, why would I want to choose Ptolemy? And here's his motivation. He says, because I want to be humble. I want to be, I don't want to be the center of the universe. I want to be humble. Now, he knows both systems work. Now, we would discard Ptolemy and we would go to the to Ty, Tychonic for, for scientific reasons, but I, I don't want to get into that right now. He's just using Ptolemy as an emblem of geocentrism. And he says, here's my motivation, because I want to be humble, not proud, and so I'm going to take myself out of the center. So there's, there's his motivation. Now, I come along and I say, what's wrong with being in the center? I mean, you're the apple of God's eye. You're the treasure of his creation. He puts you right in the center and everything revolves around you. How much greater can you be? And if God says he wants you to be great, well, then we'll be great. We're not being proud. So it's a sort of a fiend humility that Hawking brought to the whole picture and, and sort of convinced himself that, well, here, I'll give an excuse why I'm not going to accept geocentrism. And it's, and it's based not on science. It's based on how he feels, okay? That's just one example that I read. And basically, they all say the same thing. So when we want to talk about motivations for this, I see these guys admitting in their books that, yeah, I, I know geocentrism is viable, but I just don't like it. You know, philosophically, metaphysically, whatever, I just don't like it, so I'm going to do everything in my power to stay away from it. And that's what I see. So would you be disappointed if the heliocentrism turned out to be true? It turned out to be true? Yeah, if, if you were somehow convinced, would you be disappointed? I sure would. Okay. But that's a hypothetical that makes no sense here. Okay. I mean, you can throw that out to anybody who believes anything. Would you be disappointed if the opposite was true? Well, of course they would. I, I wouldn't be disappointed if the earth was in the center. Oh, well, good. You're an exception. <laughs> <laughs> okay gentlemen good job uh on on this question okay next question we've got one for you now uh taylor so a question comes in from mr t why is polaris stationary from our perspective um well because it's in line with our uh rotation uh, the the uh, center axis. Okay, uh, I'm I'm not sure if he's what what he's trying to get at. I uh, like this is, that's just. Yeah, you might want to ask him, Donnie, if he can follow that up with why he asked the question. Yeah, because I don't get it either. Yeah, uh, Mr. T, if you're actually, I see Mr. T in the chat. If you wanted to provide a little more context or reasoning behind your question, please do so. And in the meantime, we'll move. To the next question. I assume it would be the same answer for a, ro a rotating universe too. So, yeah, that's that's why I said it's not going to make a difference. It's kind of agnostic to to the overall debate. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate it. Next question comes in from Redefine Living. Question for the doctor: Do you need or have dark matter and or dark energy in your model? No. <laughs> See, that's the beauty of it. We don't need dark energy or dark matter. Why? Because our universe is not expanding. Our universe is revolving or rotating. Okay. And you don't need any extra energy. As I said in the debate, all you need is a push from God and its own momentum is going to have it uh, rotate ad infinitum. Okay. But if you have an expanding universe, yeah, you're going to need a lot of energy, especially as big as they think the universe is 93 billion light years in diameter, you're going to need a lot of energy. Okay. So no. Um, and this is one of the bugaboos of the big bang theory. Uh, you know, they've been searching for dark matter and dark energy for how long now? And they haven't even a smidgen to report to the world. Okay. So come on, man, this is not the way you do science. You don't stick to your theory and keep patching it up with these little fudge factors that allow you to keep moving and teaching people, oh, the Big Bang's correct, you know, all we need is dark energy and dark matter to make it work, and 
ipso facto, here it is. Okay. And that's just two of the problems they have with the big bank. There's about a dozen of them. Eric Lerner is one of the uh, chief proponents of how the big bank just doesn't work. And he touches on these a little bit, but many other things. Appreciate it, Dr. Sinjanis. Taylor, floor is yours. Yeah, um, so there is an, a measured effect from dark in, a matter. Um, I don't see how that's not scientific. Uh, and plus, people have modified ad hoc the uh, ether explanation as well. So um, as for needing it in your model, I'm not sure how fully fleshed out uh, your equations are, but um, it would be interesting to see if you actually have uh, rigorous uh, calculations of these orbiting uh, revolving bodies and whether or not dark matter does fit into that. I'm not qualified to understand uh, all those things, um, but it, it'd be interesting to see a, a really good physicist uh, take a look at that because I, I do know that the models of uh, in cosmology are extremely complicated, um, and uh, I would expect the same rigor from your model, uh, same level uh, of calculation. And uh, yeah, if you could produce those, that'd be that'd be cool. Yeah, you know what I'll do, uh, Taylor, is I'll send you free of charge. Um, Geocentrism for Dumskies and Geocentrism 101. That would be a good starter for you. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on your offer. Okay. And you'll okay. find out that it's not really complicated. It's really, it's actually pretty simple. And, you, you know, using Occam's razor, the simplest one's usually the one that's correct. Uh, I mean, when you have a rotating universe around a fixed earth, it can't get much simpler than that. But when you got things expanding outwards and you need all kind of energy to make it work and you need inflation to start it and you need a superluminal speed to keep it going as it's expanding, well, you got some contradictions there and it gets pretty complicated. Okay. And as far as, as, far as a measured effect from dark matter, what? What is it? See, the, you, what the, well, I, you know, like Lawrence Krauss says, well, we, we can see effects from dark matter because we see the edges of, of, the, uh, of outer space where they sort of um, um, make a boundary between one place and another. And that must be because of the dark matter. Well, okay, it could be a lot of other things. Who, who knows that it's, that it's dark matter? So what you find these guys doing is trying to find evidence there that it could be dark matter. You know, that's doing this. And come on, man, that's not science. The, the way the dark matter got here is because the Big Bang doesn't work. That's why. And now they're trying to patch it up by saying, oh, well, I may see dark matter over here, but they haven't seen it. There's no evidence that dark matter did that and the, the, that they found dark matter. It's just not there. Everybody agrees to that. It's all theory now. Okay, thank you for the last word on that question, Robert. We'll now move to the next one. This one is from Sam and it's for you, Taylor. So Sam is asking, do you agree with Einstein that the motion of the earth cannot be detected by any optical experiment, though the earth is revolving around the sun? Uh, I I don't know. I, it seems like you could uh, confirm that uh, through... Um, Oh, a lot of post-Einstein technology, like going to space, um, or just, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's one I think that could confirm it. Observations from Mars or the moon or just orbiting bodies around the Earth. Okay, thank you, Taylor. Robert, any thoughts on that? Well, that's not going to work because it's all relative motion, okay? You can't tell whether you're moving or the Earth is moving. That's what relative relativity is all about, which one of us is stable. And the, the problem with relativity is it has no stable point. And that's what we want to give it. We want to say, look, here's the Earth. It's fixed. There's your stable point. 
You don't have to go through all these relativistic gymnastics to try to find out where things are and how they're moving and how fast they're moving because you have an absolute to work with. Everybody loves an absolute. Even Newton had an absolute. His absolute was space. Space is absolute. It doesn't move. So now I can measure everything that goes on in the solar system by the fact that it's moving against a solid background called space. And that's how a system works. Okay? Even Einstein needed an absolute. That's why he wanted C to be constant, the speed of light. Because you can measure everything against the speed of light now once you know it's absolute. Okay? So... We're saying, here, look, here's an absolute for you. It's, it's called the earth in the center of the universe, the center of mass of the universe. Why don't you use it? Oh, can't do that. I want to be humble, you know, <laughs> like, like Hawking said. Now, this quote from Einstein comes from his, his um, conclusion of the Michelson-Morley experiment. I have this quote in my book. Um, he, he's... And I use it in a positive way to show that Einstein um, assumed the Earth was moving but couldn't detect it. And that's been the bugaboo of modern science forever. That's why we have the Lorentz transformation the, the Lorentz, or the Lorentz transform, because they can't figure out how to prove that the Earth isn't moving. So what you do instead of that is you plug in this... Lorentz transform, and it's in every single one of Einstein's equations, okay, because of what he just said here, that he can't detect whether the Earth is moving or not. He doesn't know. So he has to plug in this Lorentz factor. And his 1905 paper had about 15 problems, and every single one of them was supposedly solved by the Lorentz factor in that you can't, you can't determine whether the earth is moving or not, okay? So the whole thing is built on a, um, I would say, a, um, a, a shaky, shaky foundation. If you can't tell whether the earth is moving or not, then you really have no right to develop a theory of relativity, okay? Thank you very much for the response, Robert. Uh, Taylor, this time the question was for you, so we'll give you the last word. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. I mean, going back to kind of the beginning of your statement there, I think that's what uh, Einstein was getting at is um, uh, relative to whatever reference frame you have, it's, it can be difficult to tell what's orbiting what. Um, however, if you're going to look at how bodies move in the solar system we see that there are a bunch of bodies orbiting the sun okay we, we can tell that from our reference frame um and what and so there's a there's two ways to look at the the reference frame of the earth is either it's rotating or it's revolving or the sun is revolving and there's there's no additional information that would tell us that the the sun is revolving around the earth but there's a ton of additional information that tells us that the earth would be attracted to the gravity of the sun and so that observation is more consistent with reality okay thank you taylor moving on to the next question question from taylor k thank you very much questions for dr Sinjenis. so taylor asks thousands of people with telescopes and NASA employees can visually see orbits and celestial positioning. Do you think they are all wrong? No. As a matter of fact, I use their data for geocentrism. <laughs> that's, the, that's the funny thing about this whole research that I've done, is that they're my best friends because they got the telescopes, and they can uh, afford them and look at them the, the universe 24-7, and then write it up in prestigious magazines, and I go read it, you see. But I know their motivation for their conclusions is, we're going to keep the earth moving, whatever we have to do. And I come in and I say, well, sorry, you can't do that. Because every, every single data point that you bring in from your telescope is going to show me exactly what I'm saying for the geocentric universe, okay? So there's no way I would disagree with what the data is. 
The data is the data. It's the interpretation of the data that gets everybody into a whirlwind. Okay. And as, as Taylor just said, there's two ways to, to view the motion. The sun's going around the earth or the earth is rotating. I agree. Okay. Two ways. So who's right? Who's right? Now he then went back to Newtonian gravity as his source. Well, look, Newton's been superseded by Einstein. And if you can't go in that direction, then you're going to be stuck in the Newtonian thought and you're not going to advance anywhere. If you go to Einstein, the latest modern understanding of the universe, he's the guy that says, yeah, you could put a geocentric universe in all that data and you would not be wrong. Okay. Thank you very much, Robert. Taylor, uh, feel free to respond. Go ahead. Yeah, in, in terms of just describing the positions of things, it's interchangeable. But in terms of mechanism, it's not. There, there is no mechanism known for uh, uh, geocentrism. Um, but uh, like you could you could just easily program those motions in a program and it would it would be the same thing either way. Um, but in reality, you can't just tell a body to just move and it will move. You, you actually have energetic uh, limitations there, um, which we went over a lot. But uh, so um, it, this is kind of uh, similar to the previous explanation of um, the previous question. It's um, but the same is true of any reference frame. So if we were on Mars, it would appear that everything is revolving around, the entire universe is revolving around Mars. And so there's there's no way to tell that the Earth is actually the real reference frame. You would get all the same measurements. Um, so it, it doesn't seem like it's of any use to just take the Earth as the reference frame because you, you could just go and switch it to Mars. Um, and what else? Uh, yeah, um, I think I was going to say something else, but I, I lost my train of thought. Um, no worries. Thank you, Taylor. Robert, you get the last word. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, as far as mechanism is, mechanism is concerned, Einstein had a geocentric system from his general relativity. That is a fact. I just read a portion of the book here that admits that about the speed of light going way beyond C in a universe that's rotating around a fixed earth. Now, do you think Einstein had a mechanism for that geocentric universe? He did. He had a mechanism and he put it in equations. The same tensor equations he used for the heliocentric version of his general relativity he used for the geocentric version of his general relativity. And there have been many people after Einstein that have done the same thing, who have written papers showing that the geocentric system works because it's just the reciprocal of the heliocentric as far as general relativity is concerned. Hans Tiering, um, Lenz, Nightingale, Bar Barber and Bertati had one of the most famous papers on this. Um, who else? Um, well, that's that's enough. I mean, they've all been written in the last 70 years. So they're recent. Okay. So they all had a mechanism. And they could show you in the calculus that they used in their papers. And I've read their papers. Okay. So um, now as far as Mars is concerned, yeah, on a geometric scale where you're not going to measure, you know, um, how things are moving or whatever, you could put everything on Mars and say that, yeah, Mars is going to see the universe revolving around it. And as I said before, there's, it's going to be at a slightly different angle than it would be at the Earth. But as far as determining whether Mars is the true center, or whether the Earth is the true center, all you'd have to do is do a Michelson-Morley experiment on Mars. And my prediction is you're going to get a positive result. 
Why? Because Mars is moving. Okay? And that means that the reason they didn't get a positive result on Earth is because the Earth isn't moving. Very simple. So there, there is a way to determine whether Earth or Mars is the actual center or not by the same experiment we did many years ago. Okay, very good. Thank you, gentlemen, for the responses. Next one comes in from Joseph Lassiter. And he's not specifying anybody, so we'll assume it's a question for both. And he says, drop a bullet and fire a bullet from a rifle. Both will be at same level and barrel oriented in a level fashion. Which one will hit the ground first? Uh, anybody have any thoughts on that or would like to answer first? Taylor, you can go ahead on that one. I don't quite understand the question. I think he's trying to talk about the Coriolis force here, but I don't think he phrased it right. I think you, context. I think that's basically when this question um, came in was when you were guys discussing that. Oh, okay. Uh, they would both hit the ground first, assuming a, a simplistic Newtonian model, uh, because it it doesn't actually matter how fast uh, the bullet is traveling in the sideways vector. The gravity vector is still going to pull it down at the same speed. Uh, well, I would disagree with that because um, if the it depends on how fast the bullet is shot from the rifle. If the bullet is shot fast enough, it's going to go into outer space. I mean, that's the whole thing with the okay, cannon sure. yeah. that you brought up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we know. agree on that at least. Okay. <laughs> okay. If it if it can uh, get out of Earth orbit, then Sure, yeah. all bets are off. Okay. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, good job. Next question, another question for both. Ashley Myers. Does geocentrism have to mean everything has to rotate around the Earth? Why can't we be at the center, but heliocentric in our own solar system and the universe expanding around us? Gentlemen, any thoughts on that particular question? Taylor, you can go first if you want. Yeah, I think I think it's a great question. I mean, um, you could just you could simply look at our solar system as the center or the focus of of the universe. Uh, God made this little system for us, and uh, I I don't see what uh, it takes away that uh, the sun is what's being orbited around. It doesn't make the Earth less special in any way. That I can tell. Okay, thanks, Taylor. Uh, Robert, any thoughts? Okay, so, um, well, from my perspective, when I believe the Bible says the earth doesn't move, it doesn't move. And the only way that can be accomplished is if it is the center of mass and everything goes around it. If I were to transfer that to some other planet and the solar system would still be in the center of the universe, that just doesn't quite do it is it won't agree with what the Bible says, number one. And the other thing is, I don't think scientifically it's going to work either. And that's because our recent discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation um, shows that the axis of evil goes through our ecliptic plane, the sun-earth ecliptic plane, and not any other ecliptic plane. Okay, now that's significant. When you have this microwave energy that goes from one side of the universe all the way through Earth and then to the other side of the universe, and we happen to be right smack in the center of it, and no other body is, well, that puts the Earth in the exact center. The other thing is with, um, with the galaxies that they found, they have found that all the galaxies are in concentric spheres, at least around our galaxy, okay? And John Hartnett, PhD, astronomer from Australia, has done the most work on this. He is actually quoted in our movie, The Principle. And, it's, uh, I, and I had another astronomer actually test him to see if John really knew what he was talking about. And the other astronomer... What's his name? The guy that uh, bad astronomy guy. What's his name? Um, he tested John and found out John's telling the truth. All all John's mathematics work out. 
yes, our galaxy at least is in the center of the universe because all the other galaxies are in concentric spheres around it. But then there were some other guys who did even more work on it. This was a group from Michigan. Uh, what's uh, Starkman and company? There's like a group of five um, astrophysicists, and they said that the um, that the the axis of evil won't allow the galaxy to be the center of the universe. It will only allow the Earth to be the center of the universe. Now these are guys who have no vested interest in this. They're not geocentrists. And yet this is what they said, that no, the evidence points to the Earth, not the galaxy at large, the, the Milky Way galaxy as the center, because the plane, the planes are off is what their decision was. And so we had them interviewed in our movie, you know, to say exactly that, which they did. And so when you look at all the evidence, I'm convinced that it's the earth that's in the very center and not moving. Thank you, Robert and Taylor for those responses. We'll start winding it down now. I do want to respect the time that our guests have given to us tonight, but I do appreciate just how engaged the audience has been. Just a ton of questions, lots of feedback. So this one, $20 super chat, appreciate it comes in from pseudonym. And the question is for Dr. Syngenis. So we'll, we'll work through this together. He says, your explanation seems to say Mac in Einstein's relativity answers geocentrism. However, general relativity, relativity allows geocentrism, not a contradiction, question mark, without a single inertial frame and pseudo forces as explanation, question mark. Do you have any thoughts on that, Robert? I sure do. Well, there are pseudo forces in your Newtonian system. They're not pseudo forces in the general relativity geocentric system. They're real forces. And that's what got Einstein a little upset is because we can't depend on pseudo forces anymore in the Newtonian system. Now we have to deal with real forces because that's what they are in a universe that rotates. They're real forces. Okay. Now, as far as a single inertial frame, the earth is it. That's the inertial frame. You can do all kinds of tests if you have an inertial frame, the one that doesn't move, and it's not affected by anything else outside of it, okay? And that's my partner, Robert Bennett, parps on this like crazy because all these other physicists are out there saying, well, we can measure this and measure that, you know, and use relativistic tensors and all this stuff. And Robert says, you can't do that because you don't have an inertial frame. You have no absolute which to measure anything. You never know whether you're coming or going in relativity. Earth fixed gives you that single inertial frame and everything else moves around it. I mean, what a beautiful system that is. It's beautiful. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about where anything is. You can measure it because you know you have something fixed to measure it with. Thank you very much, Robert. Taylor, floor is yours. Uh, it's hard. I've been trying to parse this question. Um, it's uh, I don't do well with. <laughs> sorry to say, a bad grammar, but uh, let's see. Um, do you do you guys do you understand what they're asking, Donnie? You know, it's hard. I, I I agree. I just picked certain things out of it, Taylor, that I can yeah. answer because I did. His grammar is not uh, giving us. You know, <laughs> Coach, coach and question. Hey guys, I just work here. I just take the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I can't say that I fully understand it, but uh, I think the way um, uh, Robert yeah. answered it was well. And so maybe you had some responses to that, Taylor, if you wanted to. Yeah. I mean, one, one question I, I still have would be, uh, sorry, I'm still trying to just pick stuff out of the question. Um, in, in reference to the single inertial frames, uh, again, yeah, you, you predict uh, that experiments on Mars will go your way. I predict they would go the other way, of course. Um, so we'll see if Elon Musk will be able to uh, uh, confirm that or not uh, with his plans for Mars. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, one thing, this might have been what I was thinking of earlier, is... Uh, so if, if the earth is the center of mass, I mean, 
I'm not sure how how it can be the center of a rotating mass that the center is not rotating, but um, if that's the center of the mass, why isn't this, and it's locked in place, why isn't this a locking effect, um, why does this locking effect end at the Earth and not affect anything around the Earth, like even close to the Earth, like satellites around the Earth or the moon or something like that? Yeah, well, as I said before, the further away you get from the center of mass, the more the inertial forces are going to affect it. And that's why you see hurricanes in the north go left and hurricanes in the south go right, because the Coriolis force is affecting it. And that's because the surface of the Earth is 4,000 miles from the center of mass. So it's going to be affected. Okay, gentlemen, I, I appreciate it. We'll wrap it up with one more question here. This was an incredibly interesting debate, and I really do appreciate the time you've both given to us, uh, Robert and Taylor. So question from Redefine Living, question for Dr. Sinjenis. When discussing the speed of light, why not draw a distinction between the isotropic and ino anisotropic conventions? Is this how you would respond to distant starlight? Um. The way I would uh, respond to distant starlight is this, because the the biblicists are always picked on, because Genesis chapter one says that this God made the stars on the fourth day, and it assumes or implies that the light came to Earth on that very day. So we've always um, been put in a conundrum by our um, colleagues by saying, if light can only travel 186,000 miles a second or 300,000 kilometers per second, how is the light going to get from that star to the earth in one day? Okay. Here's how I solve that problem. Um, the rotating universe, as I said, is generating inertial forces centrifugal, Coriolis, and Euler. The further away the distance is from the Earth, the greater those inertial forces are going to be. The greater the inertial forces are, the greater the speed of light is. Okay? That means that a star that is way far away its light is going to reach Earth at the same time that a, that a star that is halfway between that star and Earth. Why? Because the light from the star that is further away, its light is going to travel faster due to the higher or greater inertial forces that are out there where that star is placed, as opposed to the star that's closer to the Earth. So... It doesn't matter where the star is that the light beam is going to reach Earth in the same time as any other star. That's how we answer that. And I can prove that by using general relativity, because that's exactly what Einstein said. And I just read it from the book that Rosser wrote. OK, so that's how we would explain it. It has nothing to do with uh, isotropy or anisotropic um, mediums. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Sanjana. Unless uh, the only reason it would be, well, no, let's not go there. Go ahead. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, Taylor, any thoughts on that? Uh, no. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I mean, is that the last question or is there another one? Well, you know what? We're, I guess we're sneaking in a bonus question because Pseudonym just, just sent in the last minute $2 <laughs> super chat. Short and sweet for you. Robertson Jenis. <laughs> Money talks, baby. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> if Earth is stationary, why doesn't it fall? If Earth is stationary, why doesn't it fall? Well, you know, this reminds me of Job. Uh, was it Job 26, 7, is it? Where said where the, it says, the Lord hangs the earth upon nothing. Mm. And this is partially related to the question. Because you have to define what falling is, first of all. Falling to us is when you throw a ball up in the air and it falls to the ground. Why? Because the gravity is pulling it down. Okay? And in my case, 
Um, when I'm talking about the inertial forces from a rotating universe, the reason those stars stay where they are is because those inertial forces are making them stay where they are. So they can't fall in or go out. Okay. So there has to be a force that's going to make it move. And if you don't have a force, there's nothing underneath the earth, so to speak, for, for um, that object to pull on the earth. That's the only way the earth would fall is if there's another um, uh, object that's going to pull it. But it can't pull it even if it was there because the center of mass doesn't move. It's locked in place. That's what I was been trying to say the whole debate. It's locked in place. That's why it's fixed because there's nothing external or internal that's going to move it. Robert, thank you. Since this is the last question of tonight, is there anything you'd like to add, Taylor, before we wrap things up? Yeah, I mean, this uh, this kind of a flat flat Earth brain question. Um, not not sure if it was meant that way or if it was meant kind of uh, to to mock the flat Earth type of brain um, of like what? Yeah, why? What holds the Earth up? Yeah, I ha neither of us really has a problem with the Earth just remaining uh, not falling because because there's not some sort of like absolute down direction you would need a, a huge source of gravity underneath the earth and and under would simply be defined by where that gravity was and it would need to be pulling the earth i think that there is a source of gravity pulling on the earth um but that would be you could say that the earth is falling toward the sun um you could you could also look at it uh, that it's moving sideways, but it's it, I think it is actually more accurate to say that the Earth is falling toward the sun. Um, but uh, of course, uh, in in orbits, you can fall towards something and still be moving around it. So, uh, yeah. All right, Taylor. Thank you. Any final thoughts on that one, uh, Robert? No. Okay. No. Gentlemen, we've made it to the end of this very comprehensive debate on geocentrism. Might just be one of the most comprehensive debates out there on this topic. So I really do appreciate the work, time, energy, and effort you both put into prepping uh, for this debate, but also doing it. I already look forward to uh, re-listening to it. So gentlemen, if you had any final words, final thoughts, again, I really do appreciate the both of you uh, giving us nearly three hours of your time. Uh, tonight, Taylor, let's start with you again. Thank you. And any final words, final thoughts? Yeah, thanks. And uh, I, I guess my my main takeaway is I'd, I'd like to know more about how these inertial forces are working instead of just saying that they are working. So perhaps we could have a maybe email exchange or, or another discussion at some point. Uh, like I said, give me your address. Give it to Donnie. Donnie will give it to me. I'll send you the books. You can read them and then we can talk. How's that? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, Donnie, I want to uh, advertise something, if that's okay sure. with you. Absolutely. Okay, uh, so uh, there is a guy on YouTube. Um, where do they go? He doesn't give his name as the uh, narrator. Um, I forget the name of the group, but they made a video about an hour long called The Ten Top Biblical Problems for Young Earth Creationists. Have you heard of it? Inspiring philosophy. Yeah, inspiring philosophy. That's the group. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I made I spent the last three weeks making a rebuttal to that video, all ten of their so-called problems. And it's two hours long. So I, I give an hour and a half of my rebuttal to their half hour of challenging us. And uh, so that is uh, gonna be up for sale on our website probably by next week it's a dvd uh two hour dvd called called refuted top 10 biblical problems for young earth or creationist <laughs> <laughs> i'll so, definitely be check i'll definitely be checking that out uh robert we had uh we you, you give me your address too donnie i'll send you a free one amen i love it okay. i can't say no to that looking for okay. we had a couple and, years and, ago uh, yeah, go ahead, Taylor. And if I could plug my uh, my other channel here. Sure. Uh, I have a channel with a debate coach as my partner, and uh, she, uh, she and I um, 
we do we do we score the debates kind of on a technical level um so uh that's kind of our gimmick uh this sunday i believe we're doing um a debate on the barbie movie and uh <laughs> so uh is it i think that the topic is roughly um is it feminist enough <laughs> so that should be a fun one Okay, well, definitely uh, to the audience, do check out uh, Snake's channel or channels. Check out uh, Dr. Syngenesis channels and website. I do have all of those links in the uh, description box. So again, excellent debate tonight. This really was awesome. I've been looking forward to this since we uh, scheduled it and the both of you did not let us down. So with that, we're just going to wrap it up. You both deserve the rest of the night off. <laughs> so, Thank uh, you, I'm hungry. <laughs> God bless. Uh, standing for truth is out. <laughs>